Hello, good afternoon, stroke morning, depending upon where you are in the world, it could be even be evening. And welcome to yet another exciting, entertaining, lore-dripping episode of Lore Beards. I hope you can all hear us out there. If you can't, drop a message right now into the comments so Make we can adjust our levels. Excellent, you rock. We're good to go. Yes, so uh, very excited. This should be, we can't say for sure whether this will be the last week, at least for a little bit, we're going to be touching this. Uh, it's definitely not the last week in the grand scheme, because um, there is there is more interesting things to touch on. But uh, we might take a break from kind of old world specific stuff uh, for next week. But, you know, we'll talk more about that at the end. But I am very, very excited for this week, because we're finally getting oh, into yeah. some really interesting topics. Um. Uh I'll be honest, to a degree, this is the week I've been looking forward to most, and I half expected us to dive into this in episode one, so in many respects, I've been <laughs> waiting for this as each week goes by, because we're about to be tackling one of my favorite subjects in Warhammer in general, largely because it's one that has been, for many, so divisive, so rewritten, so restructured so many times, that it's always fun to see what the new direction is going to be with each new edition. And the old world here does not disappoint. It goes mm. back and forward almost at exactly the same time, taking huge street leaps forward and also looking back as it does so at the past and what came before. Yeah, um, I'm particularly excited. I mean, get, the magic section is going to be the most exciting thing to talk about because mm -hmm. it the mo it's one of those things that the more I think about it, the more I want to say about it um, because there's a lot of good there, to be honest. Um, but uh, I'm also very, very excited to talk about kind of finishing off the last of these little factions and uh, <laughs> they examined. Um, uh uh, but yeah, there's gonna be a lot of good stuff here. Damn you! I ordered the core rulebook. Ooh, bummer. <laughs> <laughs> bummer. <laughs> but uh, hey, uh, you'll probably enjoy it a lot. To be frank, uh, probably build dwarf armor when yeah. they come out. Yeah. Dwarf Sorry really about good. that. Simultaneously, absolutely delighted because the more old world players there are out there, the more chance we have of yet more juicy lore drops as we progress onwards. And it moves from hopefully being a game that is quite literally specialist and on the side into something that I would really like to see becoming, if not core for Games Workshop, most certainly core in terms of the number of releases that it eventually gets. That would make me a very happy person. Yeah, I, uh, I've been sitting around trying to figure out exactly which faction i'm about to start playing and uh i'm having actually a hard time getting models yeah. uh because everything is sold out still mm -hmm. uh like even getting this core rule book uh because i finally got mine um i was not able to get this locally um it's sold out still uh i mm -hmm. had to talk to a friend who lives over in albuquerque because they had one copy left <laughs> in albuquerque and he <laughs> bought it and shipped it to me um so I personally think that's great, though, because it shows that the game is hopefully doing really well. And the team that are behind it, I hope they are currently raising their glasses of champagne to each other for all of their successes. And whilst our last two streams may have torn into them here or there, it's not a personal thing. We think that their work is extraordinary. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't pull out criticisms we, we're, where we think they're due. It also doesn't mean that we won't look at the lore that they've chosen and say, that's the choice you've gone with because we like to be critical because we're fans that's part of the fun of it and well, indeed we're almost certainly going to do a bit of that today because i do believe we might start oh, with his life yeah <laughs> uh, no i will say the other important thing about criticisms is sometimes it helps things a good example yeah. is i just got my collector's edition of the lustria book by cubicle seven uh you can old tarmacon and um the thing that i found really funny in it and also appreciated okay i, I i'm going to talk to you about that in a second uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sean. Uh, is that so? You, uh, I, I don't think we talked about it on a stream. I think we talked about it privately, but uh, on a stream, I did heavily criticize them in the Lustria book for the vampire elf. They completely rewrote that section. <laughs> Good. <laughs> like, uh, that's that's one of the benefits of criticism. Yeah, yeah, totally. There's, so there's no more vampire elves in the Lustria book. It's just an elf that's been captured, um, and now he's being held hostage, and Harkin's trying to break him, and is finding it hard. Which is great. Like that, it's like, oh, that's a way better story. Thank you. Um, so I'm glad they fixed that. Anyway, uh, okay, so I do want to bring up Sean's super chat again for the second of I saw I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I saw you did a stream on Gnome. I did. I did about? a 
I did a smaller side stream in Gnomes. Um, there was a couple of reasons that I did it. Um, I was uh, sitting down bored on a Saturday afternoon because Lindsay rather rudely went off to do some uh, sword swishing, Japanese sword swishing like she likes to do. Um, so I was bored and I was sitting at home and I thought, you know what? I could do a stream. Went over to Discord. Some people put a couple of suggestions. Gnomes came up. So I did one about that. So we got to have a chat about the Gnomes. Um, you can go watch over in Low Hammer if you fancy. It's on it's out there somewhere. Um, and uh, we also had a quick discussion about um, the next game that uh, we're doing over at Rookery Publications, which I'll just drop in. I might chat about that for like two seconds at some point, because there is a couple of links if you're desperate to go and see all the cool shit what me and Lindsay and Andy and uh, Mark can be put together. Because it's better. well cool. Okay, then I will. I won't go into any depth about it because that's not the point of this show. The point of this show is for us to dive into the good old old world. But it is worth saying that it did come up that the old world has got one of the strongest hints that the gnomes most certainly could be at least obliquely being referenced. And if you do, oh, have yeah, I was gonna say there's a here. there's a there's a gnome character in the book, um, like a, a art piece, which I'm pretty yeah. sure is looking up. Page number one hundred and twenty. Let me just bring that up there. Take a look at that wee guy. A gnome. <laughs> yeah, I'm right in the magic section as well. Now, that doesn't mean he is definitely a gnome because as is often the case with Games Workshop, they'll drop hints and they'll put obscure pieces of art in without necessarily nailing it home. But for someone who wrote the most recent gnome sections, that for me was just a small tear of joy to see that they possibly are out there somewhere. And for specialist games, you tend to find that they're far more likely to pull in on the obscure pieces of lore, the bits that other people might perhaps uh, sideline because they don't want to create miniatures for it. It's not part of the core armies. But for specialist games, it's very much part and parcel of who they are. So it's really nice to see that possibly those little guys are coming back. Um, part of my stream was discussing where they went, why they went where they are, and what I'm doing with them in my games as well. And it's just it was just a little bit of a, oh, look at that. Okay, we're going to get these last couple of <laughs> and then we're going then we're, to then we're jump headlong into the actual stream. Um, has Andy seen Cathay's new Gundam character? Rocking the right I have. And in many respects, it made me go, if anyone was going to have Gundam, it really should have been the Nipponese. Um, but having <laughs> said that, though, it did make me... Uh, I'm going to have uh, Sage from the Lawhammer game popping over tomorrow, and we're going to be sitting down and finishing off the remainder of our Nipponese lore. But th this most recent releases has certainly changed my view on certain things that I had previously said. Let's not lean into that. Where now I'm like, we can lean into freaking anything. They've got a cafe in Gundam, God damn it. Yeah, uh, well, and it, it was actually kind of cool to see that character. Uh, like, we're we're gonna do a stream going over all the new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the yeah, Seitang, uh, which is the new Sentinel, is uh, very interesting because when they released the Cathay map, a lot of people noticed that there were two Terracotta Sentinels that were like notated on the map, which indicated that they were not only freakishly important but also colossal in scale. And sure enough. Say Tang was one of them, and he is a big boy. <laughs> he certainly blinking is. So, yeah, I love that. Um, I am not against that at all. Um, as to this one, ah, uh, laughing God. What does that need to take on there being a singular mother of hags that GWCA seem to be hinting at with this? Thank you. I think that's unfortunate and sad. Um, now, that's only because I wrote significantly more than that. It makes the background feel smaller, and it makes Kislev feel a bit smaller. But if that's what they want to do, so be it. They can take it in any direction they wish. Yeah, I will say, uh, Laughing God, I would edit that to, I wouldn't even say it's a hint. They kind of just bluntly state mm -hmm. that Mother Ostankia is the hag mother. Um, and all, uh, and granted, it makes her sub faction make more sense because they're called literally the daughters. Um, which, though, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Like, you know, I would hope that if we do get an expansion on Kislev, uh, either through the old world or Cubicle 7, um, that you still have like, they do a fun job exploring the various ranks within the hag witches. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. still a lot to explore there. Um, I will say I am looking forward to the lore of hags, though. I am glad <laughs> that they budged on that and we're getting a lore of hags. I'm really excited to see it. I'm more than excited to see it. That's something that's actually made me a little bit giddy um, because there's so many different ways that they could take it. And it's always fun to see things that you've written or you've been involved with be adapted into something new. I have absolutely no expectation that the things that I did in the past will be reflected in what comes next because that's not really how Warhammer works. Everything that came before is generally seen as an inspiration to best fit in with the game you're creating at the moment. And Total War has a completely different set of needs. 
for example, to the Warhammer Fantasy role-playing game. So you'll find that the output that they create for that will always be different. And seeing what they turn it into, for me, is exciting. And that will, in turn, inform what Games Workshop eventually does with it, whether it's with the old world or something else, where they then will take what has come from Total War, they will look at potentially mm -hmm. some of the older stuff, and they'll wrap it up again into something new. And we're just all adding little extra artifacts into the greater whole that will become the background setting. So don't expect me to be the person that's going to be criticizing them for changing things i'm rarely ever that guy um if they do something that seems really odd for no reason we'll certainly call it out as i think our last two streams in this subject were pretty blatant and blunt <laughs> about we're happy to do so i mean we did um but that doesn't mean that we don't like the lore changing we do in fact the development and changes in lore are one of the things that keeps warhammer dynamic interesting and engaging for all of us yeah, and then Mandatus, I have a friend who jokingly complains everyone left AOS to play the old world. Also, Andy, why may a Chaos Dragon have one head instead of the normal two? Well, in many respects, two is just to show that they have mutated and become something else. And mutation is nothing more than a change from the norm. Two heads is a change from the norm. So one head is just as acceptable as is 12. Um, Chaos Dragon's quite literally small c chaos could appear as almost anything so i have no issue at all with those chaos dragons being one two twelve headed or nine limbed or 44 winged it's entirely down to the modeling at hand you tend to find though for the actual miniatures they have to stick with a single version possibly with a couple of options because that's the yeah. only way you can effectively create it and you'll find for total war similarly they have to create a model because you can't create 94 different models for all the different variations you potentially could have that would be prohibitively expensive so Broadly speaking here, Mandatus, I would say I have no issues with their Chaos Dragons looking like almost anything. Yeah, the, the, the idea of a standardized Chaos is almost kind of a joke in and of itself, but that is the restrictions of having a physical medium like a, a tabletop game or a video game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an elf. I'm Noblin. It's a gnome, and you've been gnomed. Yeah, fucking gnomes. <laughs> uh, I love the gnomes. Do and Stanley package here for Tony Ostankia. <laughs> I mean, that was a good try. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps there will be a time of three hag mothers. <laughs> the time. The age of three hags. <laughs> the age of three hags. Yeah, that'd be fun. So as we press on and we start diving into the actual lore from the old world, I'm going to pop up the standard disclaimer that we've had before. Obviously, if you've got any super chats you want to bring in during the course of our conversation, please do so, particularly if you have any questions that you would like to ask while we're going but we're going to take them in in stages so as we finish each one of our pages or make through our, our way through a section we'll then stop take your super chats and do it then so don't expect immediate responses once we get going because once we get going we like to get properly going and we are I am sure going to see quite a few things about the upcoming sections um for me there's a lovely mixture of really and oh my god I love this and wow yeah so Let's dive straight into it with where we left off last time, the land of ice and snow. Ice and snow. I even have it bookmarked because so, for those of you who already have your copy, you'll know it has a lovely ribbon sitting on the inside of it. So I'm bookmarked honestly, and ready to go. Honestly, a lifesaver when you're dealing with a book that large. <laughs> it really is. I'd um, say also, just to uh, start with a criticism, a lifesaver when your rules start halfway through the bloody book. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I am going to criticize that again because it deserves to be criticized. Right, let's honestly, move on. Honestly, as, as long as it was less than $30, I would not be upset if they released a very condensed book that's just the rules. <laughs> that's all it is. Um, I would own, I would not only not be upset, I would prefer it. Um, A small, uh, like a small A5 size one. I don't, I don't one. So I, around I, all my games. A, a journal book, so approximately half the width of this, which is just the rules, would be extraordinary. Paperback for easy reference during play that you could happily drop your post-its in or whatever else you're going to use to reference but just the rules this is it's a tome and it's wonderful but it is not practical for ease of use of play you know it's a thick point all right so yeah. uh the first section we start off with uh is the kingdom of kislev which is hilarious because although it's like overall pretty <laughs> solid section it immediately has a contradiction compared to the other sections of the book where the other sections keep the old lore that state that the ongol people already lived in the old world and then the gospodari people came on over the mountains and they attacked the ungol tribes as well as all the other tribes that lived in the area 
and the Gospodars conquered everybody. Yeah. Um, which still seems to be the overall narrative. Um, but then this section accidentally kind of has like a goof, or maybe they tried to summarize it and they just weirdly worded it very weirdly. But they basically were like, oh, yeah, the Ungols and the Gospodars came across the mountains, which would be a significant change, except for there are other sections that disagree with this statement in the same book. Yeah. Um, so it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So th this, this is a classic example of what feels like multiple authors or multiple voices being taken into the book and not having a very clear editorial line sitting at the top. Whomever was the producer, developer, editor of this particular book should have gone through with a fine tooth comb over every detail and not been an external editor. Now you might go, what's an external editor? Um, that's somebody who's probably come in from outside and doesn't know the lore. They are a professional editor. They might not catch these tiny little details, which to someone that knows the lore top to bottom, immediately you go, yeah, there's a problem here and that needs to be gently resolved. A single word change could have fixed this. Two words, a slight nudging of the paragraph and there would be no misinterpretation as to how this could be read but as it currently stands we have a deep lore contradiction not just with lore that came from the past but lore that's presented within this very book the gospodars are the aggressors in most situations where they came from well basically they came from the realm of chaos swept down through there went over the world's edge mountains and then like a bloody tide swept across what would become kislev conquering everything in their path the young Gauls put up the stiffest defense, but not the only ones. You also had the Ostermarkers. Ostermark used to extend right across modern Kislev, as did parts of Ostland as they pushed mm -hmm. up there. Erengrad being one of the most important cities, and again, depending on which version you go with, it was one that was Norse-founded and Ungol, or it was originally founded by the Ungols as it was before that. Um, and Prague, that was in place. Kislev at this point was not, as in the city of Kislev. Um, and they swept through and wiped out all the tribes or eventually brought them under their wing. Now, the, Go the Ungols may have been the stiffest defense. They had a lot of arguments with the, let's say arguments is a good way of saying war, isn't it? Um, <laughs> with the hags in particular, some of whom, um, if you go with the older lore, are still pissed to this day. Um, there's a very large hag called the Sea Hag that used to sit in the waters just off our Erengrad, who goes out of her way to kill Gospodars because she hates them. And that's ancient old conflicts that this paragraph here suggests aren't the case anymore, which would be an interesting change. But that's if this paragraph is correct. Um, uh, this is a simple one. An editor should have caught it. It wasn't caught. Yeah, and I feel confident saying that this was this particular paragraph was the mistake just because Games Workshop is very heavily involved using this new version of Kislev to inform the Total War Kislev, and the Total War Kislev sticks very strongly with the uh, Ungols were there first, Gospodar yeah. came over and conquered. And, um, you, and let's not get confused here. The Ungols have been here for a very long time. The Ungols were there at the time of Sigmar. Um, the Ungols mm -hmm. are actually called out um, for being allies of Sigmar and coming to the uh, Great War at Blackfire Pass. They sent a contingent of their horse archers down there because the Kislevite horse archers were, at least previously, all the horse archers were largely Ungols. And with their bare chest, their big moustaches, that's their cultural motif in comparison to the far more rich appearing, shall we say, Gospodars and their winged lancers. Um, so the Ungols sent um, horse archers down to provide support, but did not ally with Sigmar. It was an external support, and that was it. And then they went back to their lands, which in many respects were largely around the northern marches beside Ostland and around Erengrad up to pa Prague and the Translinsk area. So they've been there for at least 2,500 3,000 years. This is not a oh, they just arrived along with the Ungols. The Ungols only arrived about, what, a thousand years ago or so? So it's hmm. very, very recent in comparison. Combining the two of them and saying they both arrived is a very odd choice to make if you're trying to make it make sense. Yeah, but um, so but, it, that, it, but the rest of it, there's that. Yeah, the rest of that paragraph is fun and fine. fine. They talk about like the total war units, which is cool. About like how there's bear cavalry and there's ice sleds that carry around warriors and stuff like that. So neat. Uh, yeah, agreed. <laughs> neat. Uh, Love it. Yeah, the next section is the my favorite. Huge and a <laughs> big fucking deal. Yeah, the eastern steps. 
So this basically talks about that Kislev is significantly larger of a kingdom than it was in the old lore. Like, oh yeah, staggeringly large compared to old Kislev. So now Kislev, so in the old lore, Kislev was just that, in that little space where, you know, it's tucked around the mountains and they basically lost. It, uh, I'm going to stress that a little bit more. Um, Kislev was already huge. Um, as True. old world um, places go, it uh, leads all the way up to almost the border of Norska, down to the empire and bound by the world's edge mountains over towards its right hand, its eastern side. It's a huge area, absolutely enormous. Um, and this almost doubles it. It makes yeah. it the largest old world nation by some significant measure. I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure it's bigger than the empire. Yeah, because what they did, which I like a lot, is that basically it talks about that the Kislevites have held on to all of the territory that Khan Queen Mishka took in her kind of rampage towards what used to be Kislev, um, mm -hmm. like where actual Kislev city is, um, where she, when she came out from like the Chaos Waste into the Eastern Steppes, and then from the Eastern Steppes, she fought her way all the way across the northern edge of the Mountains of Morn. Then she came down onto um, Zornu's Cool, and mm -hmm. then she crossed the World's Edge Mountains into uh, through um, a high pass into Kislev. Well, now she maintained control of all that because the Kislevites basically built settlements, outposts along that road that over the centuries have gone from being outposts to being fortresses. No, more cities. They're beyond just fortresses. They're quite clearly marked yeah, as great, great cities. Yeah. trade cities. Karakorsi is huge. Okay, they're at least as big, if not bigger than some of the cities on the other side of the world's edge, which for me is super exciting. Um, It's super exciting for a couple of reasons, because we have several potential tales that they may be attempting to tell here. They are either saying Kislev is bigger than we had before and from now on always will be. And that's a super exciting tale because we no longer have the triumvirate of big cities that sits inside the Kislev borders, plus maybe mm. Bolgas Grag and a whole bunch of small or Stanista uh, that are spread across the enormity that is Kislev. We now have ourselves an entire empire that lies beyond, and in some respects, it makes more sense of the Tsarina and Tsar titles, the emperor, because that's effectively what they are. They're emperors, um, although they are pulled out as, interestingly, the kingdom of Kislev, um, which I thought was <laughs> an interesting choice to make as a title. Um, and they've got themselves a huge area of influence, or they're intending on telling the story of the destruction of half of Kislev um, as it's wiped out during the great attack of chaos by Azavar Kul. They've effectively created a host of new cities that sit on the other side of the mountains, cities that connect various empires in a really good way for building a game, in that Cathay is now attached. Norska is directly on them. The Chaos Dwarves are directly on them. The Hobgoblins are directly onto the Old World now in a way that they weren't really before. So this links all of these factions over in the East to the West into the Old World in a way that would have been impossible before. So I love this. It's super cool because it added all this extra territory, but I think it does open up the possibility for us to have Azivar Kul come in and destroy all all of it, leaving Kislev almost a shattered remnant of what it used to be after the Great War Against Chaos. And for me, I think if that's the story they're going to tell, it's beautiful because Kislev always looked like it came out of that war largely untouched. At best, they lost a little bit of northern territory up in troll country as it went a bit wilder and the spring drivings of the Chaos Marauders wiped out the northern sections. But that's not a great loss given how little they had up there already. This suggests that Kislev may be reduced to almost half its size. And I actually love that. It's mm. The idea that we're going to have ruined cities sitting over on the other side of the world's edge and an imperial Kislev very interested in attempting to retake those by going back over the world's edge into what is now a shattered land. Oh, I love it. That's a great tale to tell. And that would, I think, make for a really good Kislev book and an update to the Kislev book. If I was doing it again, I think that would be a super fun thing for us to tackle as a set of backgrounds because you've now got ruined cities to visit. You've got cool stuff. And the trade paths that still go through those areas connecting east and west. So we get lots of stories of different groups all meeting in the middle in this shattered land. I think that would be super fun. But they might not be doing that. They might leave Kislev in its new version entirely untouched. It's for us to see.
Yeah, one of the things I will say that I love so much about this is there was always kind of a conflict in different versions of the lore where if you look back mm -hmm. at like fifth edition, it very strongly suggested that the, the overland route to Cathay was typically to go over the world's edge mountains through skull the follow the skull road and then go along the north of the mountains until you went over to the great bastion uh, which is the way the Talaeans got there which uh with when we talked about the Talaean section earlier seems to still be the case is that yeah. the Talaeans discovered that first overland route um but then in later lore like seventh edition or especially and especially after the ogre kingdoms were introduced it basically went oh no 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 they have this uh they have like this kind of silk road that or the ivory road that goes through the ogre kingdoms because that's what made Greece's gold tooth so rich is that he allowed trade along this road that then yep. go kind of pops out near the warpstone desert and goes to Shenyang, which becomes the most powerful trade city uh within Grand Cathay because of that. But this now allows both of those to coexist in a really interesting mm -hmm. way, and in that the Talaeans are credited from the old world still having discovered that route but the Kislevites actually control it. And A, it makes, the, the biggest thing for me is this means Kislev is no longer the empire's hat. Um, instead of simply being the bastion that protects the empire from the predations of chaos, now they feel like an empire that's doing its own thing. It mm -hmm. has now this incredible trade route that it's actually protecting that's open with Grand Cathay. And they still say that, you know, it's incredibly dangerous, despite the fact these cities are very large cities, they're thousands of miles away from each other. So you still have to take these large caravans to get from one to the other because you're still passing by ogres and hobgoblins and others, uh, marauders and all sorts of other different forces that are going to prey on them. But it offers a, a, a very exciting different way to get to Grand Cathay that's going to face different kinds of challenges and different kinds of enemies. And like Andy said, makes the hobgoblins especially significantly more relevant mm -hmm. to what's going on in the old world. Oh, yeah. Um, but the other thing for me is just that it Kislev is doing its own thing, which in Warhammer, Fan the older Warhammer fantasy, it just wasn't. Um, it was just it was quite literally the shield the Empire had against the North. And that was it. That was kind of its only function, um, yeah. which was always kind of like eh, like they. It, this feels like they have agency, which is very, very nice. I could not agree more. They've basically built an incredibly important bridge between different editions, between East and West, between different factions. And this edition makes such a huge difference to making sense of everything. I actually love this. Now, whether their intent was to do this or not, I kind of don't care because the <laughs> ramifications of what they've done is bluntly extraordinary for making sense of everything in the old world and the east but also making sense of their game making sense of the different factions warring against each other making sense of basically everything i could not like this section more if i tried and when i first read it a huge smile spread across my face and one reason that a huge smile spread was because I kind of wanted to do this myself approximately 10, 11, 12, quite a few years ago um, <laughs> when I was writing the Kislev book because uh, I could see the problem that Kislev had. And I asked specifically, can I effectively go for what was often dubbed by Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1's uh, fans as the Wheatlands? Because in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1, Kislev had settled the other side. It was an empire. Um, and in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1, there was an entire setup what was, what was beyond the other side. And the answer was definitively no. Kislev ends at the World's Edge Mountains. Whatever lies beyond the World's Edge Mountains is here be Dragon's Land. Unless, of course, it's part of the Cursed Dwarves or the Hobgoblins or the Ogres. Or... But no, you can't do that. And I was like, okay, that, that kind of sucks. Never mind. Um, so that was just left. And instead, I took all of the extra information that had come from, say, the Go Trek and Felix novels and elsewhere. Uh, books like Riders of the Dead or alternatively the army list that was created by Gav Thorpe for Kislev. Took all of those details and wrapped those in instead. Made sure all the locations that had been mentioned in those books were added. What I find super fascinating, though, is just one final detail. And it's one that we're going to cover later when we do the maps um, because we have a lot to say on that bad boy. Oh, yeah. Um, they, uh, they've they gone back to the maps of almost first edition for Kislev with bits of later versions of Warhammer in it. But it does mean we have an enormous chunk of forest where beforehand it was described clearly as open oblast. And I hope that they've done that for a reason. And I'm hoping that reason is that they are going to flatten it. 
because I think that would be super cool to show the massive changes that a war against chaos will inflict upon the land when it eventually occurs. I just love the idea of the whole thing getting devastated, properly ruined, Kislev a mess. And this would be one way to show it as the geography itself changes because of the incoming tide of chaos. That's awesome. So, mm, yeah, I, there's lots yeah. of changes here and I'm looking forward to seeing how what they do with it. Yeah, when they when they get around to doing the campaign for Asvar Kul himself coming south, mm. it is going to make him a a significantly more he's going to feel more like a genuine ever chosen threat if what we have is instead of him just kind of coming down with his four lieutenants and they they destroy Prague and that's kind of it. Yeah. Um where now it's if they come down from the chaos waste and it's this tide that hey the other thing i really like which they established this in the total war war number three uh prologue but seeing it actually written in the lore is really cool of that kislev essentially has a bunch of sentry forts that stretch up into what is quite literally almost the realm of chaos itself like they have sentry forts going way up north which is so exciting because that means they're able to like send word that there's a chaos invasion coming which makes mm-hmm. so much sense for them that they would have these forts stationed by, you know, little gar- little garrisons whose goal is to hold the line if they can, but more importantly, to send word home that something is coming. But having this storm of chaos come south, and what I'm hoping they do, like Andy said, is that they crash into this part of Kislev and just wreck the shit out of it. And then what I'm hoping we'll see is we'll see Asvar Kul's horde split where half of it goes on to throw itself against the Great Bastion and the other half with Asvar Kul himself comes down uh and starts pouring into kislev proper but if they do that and actually end up with the same rough map that we had in like seventh and eighth edition fantasy that's going to make as of our cools invasion devastating like, oh yeah it, this is no longer like oh he destroyed a city it's yeah no he literally took one of the largest human empires of the modern age and broke it in half over his knee which is going to be um, way more appropriate for an And chosen. massively changed its geography in the process as well. So its internal geography. Yeah, the changes. actual like realm of chaos beautiful. stretching south. Yeah, like, that would be things. awesome. I mean, that makes it feel like he is an impactful character. Now, um, I've done various maps for the battle for Kislev Gates and similar. In fact, we're going to be mentioning a little bit about that in a moment as we move into the next section. Yeah. Um, and I'm very much... Um, uh, a fan of Azavar Kul, but I equally, I remember when the uh, Empire at War book was uh, getting planned out and released, that was by Black Library, and I received the text for the Battle of Kislev's Gate bit, and it was suitably epic, and it was Magnus facing off against Azavar Kul at the gates of Kislev, but I remember looking at it going, man, this is an opportunity to really make the Ever Chosen awesome, and to reinforce how cool Archeon is, and it kind of just tells the same tale again, and there's a lot of space here to make him bigger. And they've not taken it. That's an interesting choice because I wasn't a writer on that book. I was a cartographer and external chatter about text. Um, and when I read it, I was like, bit disappointing, but I'll live with it what it is. This is set up to make an enormous story. And that, for me, is deeply gratifying. Yep. All right. I'm going to catch so up. We on do these. a couple of super chats. Yep. Uh, yep, yep. So- uh, now it makes sense why Boris Ursus starts near Uskalak on the Realm of Chaos map in Total War Warhammer 3. Yeah, well, and if if you actually play through the prologue in Total War Warhammer 3 and you actually, like, look at the settlements that you're dealing with, you're in these, like, what are essentially, like, distant sentry forts, like, uh, and they are, you're way the fuck up north. Like, you are in the very borders of the Realm of Chaos and then go into the Realm of Chaos proper as part of that campaign. And the the what the prologue is covering is the fall of these forts. And when you're playing as Boris, Boris Ursus in um, the Immortal Empires campaign, basically you're playing as Boris has left uh, regular Kislev and he is reconquering these fallen lands. He's basically taking back Kislev's northern territory, which is awesome because he's fucking Boris. Um Sean yeah. Stoltz, uh, <laughs> what does Andy think of the Tiger Men might be brought into Total War? You know what I can't help but sing? They're great! <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Andy, we're not sponsored. Oh, don't I can't believe I did that. Um, so, I got free, commercial, free commercials aside, I honestly could not be happier with more detail being added to the world. As on to thoughts about how X interacts with Y, it requires X be fully detailed before we can say how they will easily interact with Y. But I will say they're rather distant from each other. 
yeah um but yes i i too am very excited for tiger man mm-hmm. uh, all right so let's get this out of the way so <laughs> there is there is a part of the new lore that i think anybody that reads it will kind of raise an eyebrow because it's a very odd decision um and like I- so just just to cut just cut to the quick the matter so in the new lore they have expanded the on the rulers of kislev so in the old lore the only thing we had for the great war against chaos was czar alexi or not quite i'm not quite um because i'm gonna i'm going to help justify their choice a little bit oh go ahead for all i dis i'm not gonna say despise that's far too strong for all i would have rewritten it (laughs) czar alexi um is given a house name in at least one book i can think of because i was involved with said book um and that's romanov um and i hated it then and i called it out then and i hate it now more for completely different reasons and i do mean i hate it i think it is an absolutely awful choice for the uh, name of the ruling family of kislev for all manner of reasons but in one the, do i have it here i don't have it the empire at war they do drop that name i called it ah, out then interesting yeah okay. dropped an empire at war i because i have done quite a lot of research say, to go and justify their choice better here. that they didn't just come up with that for this yeah. edition that it, it's me just too a, i i do wish they had changed it <clears throat> um so uh i uh, the reason i called it out then was because Kislev is definitely not Russia. As we all know, if we were to say it was, then we wouldn't have things like winged lancers. They have as much to do with Russia as any of the other various Eastern European bloc countries do, in that not very much unless you happen to be Russia and claim that you control all of these things, which I think is an unfortunate position to be in. And Games Workshop is here, whether they wish to be or not, making political statements about what is and what is not the case. And some people will use this as justification for a variety of things. I would rather not be part of Warhammer. We want to keep these things separate. The Romanovs as a name is poor and worse, it's also the name of Natasha Romanov. The same spelling, the stupid spelling that they've just lifted (laughs) from somewhere else because Marvel are just as bad at lifting shit as Games Workshop are. And basically, they've basically they've said, you know, you know, Black Widow. Yeah, she's got the same name as our rulers. Seriously. Yeah, Not and great. I I will say that there's this there's this um, whole thing where 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 I think is what I I have to guess is what inspired them because it happened over here in America at least that I remember the whole thing with Anastasia and the Romanovs had this like fantastical element to it. Where you know there's the there's the really famous cartoon movie they made animation that leans into the fantastical elements of Anastasia surviving the fall of Russia and um, how that was a whole thing for a long time, uh, and it it, it seems like that inspired a lot of Western mythological look or fantastical looks at Russia of like oh if we're gonna do something then we should use Romanov because there's all this romanticism and fantastical elements to it. Uh, even though the truth of it is like super ugly, um, really ugly, and it's, if anything, it's only gotten worse with time. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't want to get in depth on this too much because I it might turn into a rant that nobody really wants to hear. But I will say this: given the current political tensions, I think using the Russian royal family as your inspiration is a bad choice it's just a bad one particularly because it it starts telling stories about what kislev is and the sort of people that should respect kislev for exactly what it represents particularly given what's going to occur um so i find it an unfortunate choice for many reasons i don't want to discuss here that being the case i will say something it is a use of older lore and bringing it forth and i imagine unthinkingly just bringing it in and using it But, and this is the big but, they completely changed the empire. And when I say they completely changed it, they used the existing lore that was there before, and they based their version of the empire upon it, but they changed the names involved, they changed the characters involved, and they even changed the family lines, they changed where they're cited, they changed where the important factions sat, they renamed entire parts of it. 
And they did that without any concern or worry, and I would argue have not made it better. All they've done is make it different. In Kislev, they would have made it better if they had just renamed it, because it would have had significantly less real-world tension attached to it. This is a decision that I don't just decry as being a bad one. I'm going to call it out firmly as being an exceedingly poor choice that should have been edited out. Yep. Well, um, on the... So there's that. There is that. Um, as far as the rest... Not worrying about the name. Um, overall, I do like a lot what these paragraphs have to say as far as mm -hmm. it reestablishes the kind of like the importance of the ice queens and how there's a lineage of con queens um, that's not necessarily like uh, direct, um, which is nice. It's not necessarily a direct lineage from like Mishka to the modern ones. And we, of course, have the ice queen who very tragically is doomed to an unfortunate fate uh, mm -hmm. because we know who's going to be in charge when Asvar Kul shows up. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have Mashinka. So Mashinka Romanov is the current ice queen of Kislev. Uh, unfortunately, unless there is a significant change to the lore, she is not going to make it to the Battle at the Gates of Kislev. Um, mm -hmm. Which is but, no surprise, because we are talking, what, 30 odd years. Yeah, yeah, we've got like a quarter of a century. Yeah, um, we've, got but, a, we've got a bit of time here. Yeah, I do like the way they talk about ice magic, that, you know, it's drawn from the land itself, that it's a very unique form of magic that uh, has, uh, they, they have a really, they have a lot of really good mysteriousness with it. They lean into the fact that the Gospodars are where the ice witches come from. Uh, yep. And that they are a Gospodari line. Uh, and the other thing that's really interesting to me is that... Um, I'm going to call out the bit that I'm going to call out. Let's find out. Uh, so the thing that <laughs> call, jumps out to me that I like very much is that Mashinka is played as a very interesting Tsarina and in that she's ruling with an icy iron fist. It's kind of implied. Where she is using specifically... She is putting up this air of mystique and power and mysticism to keep control of her realm, um, which we'll get into the next paragraphs about her son. Her son has a very different perspective on things, mm -hmm. uh, which I actually like a lot. Um, but the, the thing that is very, very fun for me about this is it really plays up how the ice Queens very deliberately and politically use an air of being mysterious enigmatic poorly understood to kind of rule over their people using like supernatural fear um which i actually think ties really well into perfect <laughs> aspects of like how the hag witches uh relationship with the ungles is um yeah. but i i really like how they're portraying the ice court um so in this paragraph I love this. Um, in fact, I love these next two paragraphs, barring one bit. And it's not that I don't like the one bit that I'm about to call out. It's just that it's a change. And it's potentially a fundamental one, given the, some of the language that you're using. And I'm not sure they fully intended to make the change. But they make it here, and they also make it later on in the book. So I've got a feeling it is a purposeful change. Here, they call out that good old Alexei could have been an ice wizard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is enormous. That goes against the lore, largely as we've had it previously suggested in, say, Realms of the Ice Queen, and also the lore that became, founded the basis for what we have in Total War, where the ice court, all the ice witches, are women. And here we have a suggestion that that might not be the case. And that is kind of huge. It basically says good old Alexi doesn't have magic like Ma, but has his own opinions and thinks these things. And that is not just slightly big, it's enormous because it completely changes the entirety of how Kislev views magic. It would be a little bit like having our Bretonian faction saying, you know, the king had a son and he hasn't got magic, um, so he's doing this instead, suggesting that the king, if he'd had a son, could have had, I don't know, what? Some wizard son that was doing wizardly things? That's not how male wizards work in Britonia. But is it now? And here there is that suggestion that Alexei could have been an ice witch. Now, I interlaced inside um, the old Kislev book that there were many, many prophecies about a male ice witch coming forward, one who was in touch with the ice flows, who would be fundamental in terms of leading Kislev into its next step. That was basically setting up the end times and the idea that a son 
of the ice, which would be a fundamental character involved with that as a potential. That's basically seeding seeds for future writers to use. So you set out myths so that if a future writer spots it, they'll go, oh, I'll use that bit and I'll weave that into my lore. Part of writing for Warhammer isn't just writing the things that you think are good or trying to match lore. It's also trying to help future writers develop things and create their own bits of awesome, their own nuggets of cool whenever they're doing Warhammer. Um, so you could argue it's trying to suggest for that. But as I say, a later on suggestion again makes it clear that ice witches might not just be women and that is kind yeah, they of leave, they leave a nice crack in the door there they do um, there's a which, crack yeah which is which could be very interesting and then the last thing for the kiss love section is prince alexi who actually i really like the way he's portrayed as a character uh because the only things that we really had about him in the old lore was that he existed he mm -hmm. was a reasonably competent czar and he he actually survives the Battle of the Gates of Kislev. He does. He even, he even kills Valnir the Reaper in a duel, which is a pretty big accomplishment, which for those that don't know, Valnir the Reaper was not only a playable special character in the Champions of Chaos book, but was the champion of Nurgle and one of the four lieutenants of Asavar Kul. And Alexei fucking killed him, um, which yeah. is very impressive. He gets um, his moment in the sun, his five minutes of fame. Nailed it. Yeah. Uh, so for this, it basically talks about that he's an incredibly skilled diplomat. He's an exceptional warrior. They talk about that he's trained at riding horseback, and he also fights with a war bear, which is awesome. We love bears. Um, and talks about he's led a lot of campaigns to the north. But the thing that is the thing that makes me laugh is that he actually is expansionist in an interesting mm -hmm. way, and his mother doesn't like that. Um, it talks about that, uh, much to his mother's consternation, the prince speaks of personally leading his forces beyond the furthest reaches of troll country to expand Kislev even further north. So taking Kislev into Norska um, and into further into the chaos waste, which is very interesting. But when he talks about the empire to the south, instead of talking about conquering, he wants to use diplomacy, though I like this a lot, a unified empire under a single leader. And <laughs> that his mother likes. <laughs> of course. Yeah, that's not going to fly with the empire. Um, yeah, but you yeah, can, no. But I, what I particularly like about this is that it contextualizes the politics of Kislev at the time. So let's have a little think about what it actually is in comparison to what we think of. Kislev is one unified land that reaches from the borders of what used to be the Empire. For all we call it the Empire, it currently isn't. This mm, is the Dark mm, Ages for the Empire. It has collapsed. Okay, so we've got from the border of the Empire all the way over to effectively Grand Cathay. It's fucking huge. Really massive. They rule all of that. And he's looking out and going, Empire has gone and has been gone for centuries. We should start making proper advances into that and unifying that underneath one single rule. And the Empire, which is so massively fragmented and broken, would look like an easy, tempting target, particularly if you look at where Ostland is at this point, or Ostermark, both of which are quite far away from their ruling concerns, meaning that it'd be very easy to take them if you wanted to do so militarily, although he's suggesting perhaps trying to do so through diplomacy. The diplomacy wouldn't work. The Empire's too fragmented and broken. It's almost a fool's dream. Conquering it, would yeah and the thing i really really like about this is it, it talks about that alexi and his mother have yet to find someone with the will or vision to unite the fractured southern peoples which is such a delightful way to refer to the empire <laughs> fractured yeah. southern peoples but it's accurate it's and, true it's just it's and just i love it to see that yeah yeah I, I particularly love that because it it reinforces that the empire is not the more the most powerful uh the old world's pardon me most powerful empire by far from it i would argue right now it's quite clear that kislev has primacy and there is a certain amount of uh there is a certain amount of warlike gospodars would probably have taken advantage of this over the course of the last three four hundred years there's a little bit of a surprise that for example kislev doesn't incorporate parts of what we consider to be modern times ostland and ostermark because why wouldn't they it's a fragmented mess. They could bring this under their authority and control and use those people to best uh, effect. It would also, to a degree, justify some of the um, odder choices for the descriptions for 
for example, Ostlanders, Ostlanders who are often presented almost like the Kislevites. Take a look at Valmer von Raukov and his very big long moustaches, his, yeah. his Eastern style clothing. His older model is very Eastern European in style and not because Ostland was styled as that. It meant, in many respects, it meant when I was writing Ostland, I had to make it much more Eastern European in flavor, which let's be blunt, really upset some people out there because they didn't <laughs> like the idea. They really didn't like the idea of different ethnicities being held within the empire, even though it's created from completely different tribes. The idea mm. that the Udoses were in fact an Eastern style tribe did not go down well with some people with perhaps um, a darker tone to their skin, with a uh, darker hair as their standard, a shorter folk, bur burly and sturdy. Um, and that did not go down well with certain people because they wanted them all to be effectively white German. And um, that is equally an interesting outcome. But there's lots of things they could have done here to mix it up. They chose not to. But they have here, in this paragraph, shown that it is an ongoing concern. And for me, I really like that. Because even though they didn't change the map, they did change the opinions of the people of the time. Yeah, well, and it, it opens up some really fun ideas for potentially there being like a, a campaign that focuses on border skirmishes mm. between Kislev and the Empire. As maybe Kislev becomes frustrated with the Empire, knowing as far cool is coming, and is like, no... We need one unified people against chaos. Y'all either need to get on board or we're going to whip you on board. And then yeah. in comes Magnus the Pious. Um, so really, really like that. Um, that pretty much wraps up the Kislevite section, but it it's, it's got a lot of really cool stuff going on. Yeah, um, agreed. Um, I like Kislev a lot. Um, I like where they're taking it. Um, I'm not so sure I like the idea that the young golds will get wrapped in with the Gospodars, but hopefully that's not an ongoing issue. I'm not sure I like the change that ice witches won't just be witches because it allowed Kislev magic to be separated and different to the types of magic yeah, you've got elsewhere. The way but, I read it, I feel like it's trying to still say they're just female, though I do agree it, it kind of vaguely implies Alexei might have some latent magical gift. Because it also talks about him foreseeing an invasion of the Dark Gods, which almost implies he's having visions. It does. Um, I mean, it does sound like a latent magic user. But um, so, it could, be, but, could be his mother knows and is hiding that from everyone. It, very well. She's, but she's his only son. And especially if you're playing on the idea that male wit witches are seen as a bad thing in uh, Kislev. That which would that would be, really well. oh, that would be yeah. so juicy. If and if that was the know. story, I would be 100% behind that because that's a really good story. Um, so, will we grab um, the extra little bits of super chats before we go on to Grand? Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, starting off with Luring Lion. Speaking of, <laughs> oh dear, prologue, cough, cough, Addy. Right, there's a reason I've not started. It's because I'm build rebuilding my garage right now, which is where I intend to play everything. I will be doing it in a completely different space. Um, we have our workmen coming in literally next week. So, the second that's finished and I move in, that's when it all starts. Um, we are, we have a plan. It's just unfortunately involving rebuilding and a bunch of workmen that didn't start when I originally hoped they would. So we're just a a anyone who's ever had house repairs or construction knows the pain. Yeah, uh, it's, Madonna, it's painful. Thank time. you very much for the classic eighty-eight, eighty-eight. I was always super. You man, you thank were like you very much. bankrolling the both of us like almost on a weekly basis. We thank you so much. Yeah, uh, can't the can't express our thanks enough. The implication that the Kislev route goes across the mountains of Morn to the first gate of the Great Bash is not only impressive for Kislev holding it and traders traveling it, the relationship between Kethe and Kislev uh, um, established being broken by mm -hmm. Asvar Kul seems like it'll be a significant thing. Yeah. <laughs> Huge. Huge. Like the idea that it kind of almost implies, which I love, that there was almost a thing happening that between the Ivory Road and the, the Skull Road trade routes that the East and West were kind of coming together and uh, that K Cathay and Kislev especially were real. Instead of the empire leading the charge on unifying with Cathay, it's Kislev leading the charge on unifying with Cathay. But then come down comes as of our cool as this fist of the dark gods, hopefully to shatter this connection and break it so badly that it's no longer acceptable to, go the northern trade route now you need to go the ivory road which then leads to the rise of the ogre kingdoms and the as, rise of greases yeah and the rise of greases like that mm. would play in so well and also establish this perfect tragedy of almost the dark gods seeing the unification of kislev and Cathay as a threat mm. and throwing as cool as kind of this bomb meant to destroy that potential relationship which i really like the idea of 
Yeah, if I was writing the narrative for this, I would reinforce that there was a growing connection between Alexei um, and one of the dragons. In fact, I might even build a romance into that so it could be properly shattered, largely because you're looking to create an anthropomorphization, I can't get the word out, anthropomorphization <laughs> of the greater conflict. And seeing that shatter and seeing the pair of them becoming bitter after an initial really strong relationship would, I think, just be beautiful. I could also speak to the character that, oh, what's her face um, on the Northern Bastion? Meow thank you. No, thank you. Um, could lead to her character and who she is later. You could have her have a, a character development from where she is here to where she becomes when we're looking at Total War um, and see her move on um, and become far harsher because of this and uh, because of the war that erupts here and what it did. And I think there's something potentially awesome in that because I like that to see fit. characters so shifting and moving and developing with their arcs. And if we end up with a bunch of characters who effectively are identical 200 years later, for me, that would suck. But if we've got characters who are presented one way, which leaves us going, what? But but the Total War version is like this. Then events occur, and you're like, oh, right. <laughs> that yeah. would be fun. Meow Super Ying cool being narrative. described so heavily as cold and aloof, if this played into that, where like she is warm with Alexi or yeah. with Islavites, and then shit goes, you know, tits up, as they say, that would be... Ooh, and be having nice. someone who is a latent ice um, wizard uh, potentially prophesized, okay, someone who's using ice to chill the already cold heart. There is something beautiful in there in terms of what we could tell as a story. Um, and that would be a lovely way to have their ongoing relationship and then the fracturing of it, then their break be uh, a quick way of understanding the greater horror that chaos is intending to inflict in these great realms emrick emrick shipper shippers in shambles <laughs> <laughs> totally uh, yeah. screw that <laughs> commander bone hi question if nippon was ever added which way do you think games workshop would lean towards it do you think it'd be better to go the kislev and Cathay way and make it mostly humans plus some ogres gone native plus yokai with oni being distinct from ogres or would you foresee it being a different way so personally, I think that um, each one of the various human nations that they add will be human nations with whatever extra addition they decide to put on top of it. So yes, I would prefer for them to go and find anything stronger than 60%, perhaps even higher. Um, but I would equally, particularly for Nippon, look at it and see that they almost certainly should have discrete and distinct native species that are perhaps different, brought underneath the control. I found one line in the Cathayan section that we're about to move on on to actually plays into this and I think is worth bringing up. I think it's in the next section. Anyway, I'll just have to double check. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, in fact, there's one line that didn't just doesn't just play into this. It actually makes me question what is going on in the East entirely. So we'll get on to that in just a moment. Yeah, but uh, I, I would agree with Andy. Uh, if anything, Games Workshop, especially through the Total War lens, has been demonstrating a pretty good handle on trying to evaluate like percentages of like, okay, this human, this human nation is going to be themed in this general way um, where if the pawn is going to be distinct, then having them really be the human nation that is not necessarily, that is while mostly human focused has a much stronger focus on spirits and magical creatures and stuff that in interlive among them would yeah. make them very distinct. Even from what vague things we know about like the kingdoms of end and grand Cathay where grand Cathay is like significantly more human but ha is ruled over by these magical entities. Um, and then the kingdoms of end, we, you know, we, we still don't know a lot yet, but like being the land of a thousand gods, it seems to be a land where there are a lot of humans, but there are a lot of creatures oh, intermixed other things too. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I, I agree with this entirely. I'm, 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 I'm as long as they, right. if they just like keep, you know, adding different seasons and spice uh, seasoning and spices to all the different human factions to make them each distinct, and their relationship with the entities or creatures that live among them, that, yeah, great. I, I think it'll be good. Yeah. Um, yeah, agreed completely. Ah, yes. yes yeah, I haven't. Yeah, the classic Ice Witcher and the Shadow of the Horn Rat. Yep. Um, so I, I'll call out this one in particular because the, um, the Ice Wizard, good old Vladimir, um, inside uh, Horned Rat and Dark Omen was a character that 
we had to consider when we were creating the new version of the ice witches um and i actually pinged uh, a note about this back to gw as to whether we should just ignore it and go with our new version that we were building or whether we should incorporate it and the note that came back was super short yeah no that character doesn't exist as far as we're concerned just move on without it so i would personally have preferred to have written in something that would have incorporated that character because that's generally how i prefer to write i prefer to try and make sure that all of the existing lore and characters that are out there can exist within whatever framework i'm building but in this case i was expressly told not to yeah uh necromancer cobalt trans women and cross dressers as ice switches you know we, me and Eddie actually talked about that during the Hags stream. Yeah. Uh, there is a really interesting concept that could be explored there. Um, there is. And whilst this comment looks like it might be relatively flippant, um, I will actually say that there is a great deal about gender to be discussed around these areas because gender is a fluid, complicated thing, no matter how much some people try to force it to one of two extremes. Gender is complex, man. And gender in terms of how it expresses with people is also complex. Now, given that so much of that is mental, and that magic in and of itself, the aether that it comes from, is a realm of imagination and mental components. It actually doesn't matter a great deal what the physicality is. What matters instead is the bigger picture. So yes, I agree there is a great deal of complication here. And the simplicity that some people would attempt to use to reinforce their views and say, no, it's only this or it's only that, would tell some good and potentially horrific stories. Stories I personally couldn't tell because they are stories that lie quite outside my general comfort zone and space and understanding. But I know many people who could. I've hired writers who could tell those stories themselves. And they would be, I think, really good, potentially harrowing, potentially uplifting, potentially one of many different things. But um, I think there is a greater story there that I think Games Workshop will almost certainly avoid like a plague. Yeah, I, I would say if, if Games Workshop hired like a writer who has been through the experience of being trans or like having a complex relationship, a much more, much more complex relationship with uh, uh, their self identification when it comes to gender than a lot of people do. And had that story told through the lens of someone that is an ice witch that's not a, was not necessarily born the easy way to become an ice witch that could be a very emotional and fascinating story really good but they would have to hire a very specific type of writer to handle that yeah particularly if it was a story of acceptance as well showing that the warhammer world is so very different to the real world and where all of its prejudices lie mm -hmm. i mean here in the real world we've got all manner of people who have issues with gender and it's not just simply people who may be for example trans many autistic people have significant issues with gender and understanding the very concepts of how it works um my very family has um a, let's say a host of fun issues involved around that and that is something that i think is very poorly expressed in the monogendered or not monogendered pardon me in the bi-gendered cultures that are often written about largely because they're written about people who are themselves in that culture so they don't really think of what lies beyond where you find if you look back into history most cultures have got all manner of different ways of expressing gender, right down to the core of their language, where their language may even enforce gender upon things that have no gender. There is a bigger conversation that could be had there, which I think would be fun to at least examine in some fashion. So yeah, thanks for that one. For all the comment may have looked like it was vaguely flippant, I think it's a really good one. So thanks very much for dropping that one in. Yeah, uh, Commander Bond, thank you for the super chat. I think we kind of uh, have tackled this fully. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Games Workshop seems to have buried Vladimir, but the, they might yeah. not have fully buried the concept of there being the rare case of male ice witchers. Mm, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, Arunthiel, thoughts on the Celestial Lion potentially being a chaos creature purified by Shen Yang? Do you think Shen Yang had children before meeting Kui Yen? Uh, okay, so uh, the new the new Kislev stuff, the Celestial Lion, I would heavily suspect that the Celestial Lions are just kind of a natural species that their transformation due to the influence of magic has has leaned more into a noble aspect thanks to the influence perhaps of Shen Yang um because of where they're native to being native to like the the areas around him um but i would see them being more like griffins where it's something that happened over time and they became noble beasts but where i don't think shen i doubt that shen yang like 
purposefully created a form of life. That prop that to me that seems like something he probably doesn't like to do very much outside of his actual constructs. Um, because that probably would smack to him of what the old ones did, who he seems very critical of. Um, but I think the idea that what he has done in Grand Cathay would have an impact on how the creatures develop so that instead of ending up with a manticore, you end up with a celestial lion. I think there is a lot of strength behind that theory. Um, but I would hesitate to say that Shin Yang would have done it deliberately. Uh, I wouldn't put it past him, but that would surprise me. Um, the celestial lions seem much more like creatures that are native to the lands. And because of Shin Yang's control over Cathay, they developed more into the celestial entities as opposed to chaos entities. Um, yeah, I'm. But it's I, hard when to I read, that we have more details. Yeah, when I read that, it was uh, almost a castaway sentence, which could uh, could almost go almost any way when they add extra depth. But when I read it, um, my first thought was, what's the difference between these chaos creatures and a freaking giraffe or an elephant? <laughs> um, just. J- the Warhammer world is filled with native creatures that are not in the real world. And to cast anything as a chaos creature is in and of itself an interesting choice. And then to say it's purified, not to say that there wouldn't be any of those, clearly there would, but it does leave that suggestion that anything that is just not standard in the real world is suddenly now a chaos creature, while simultaneously the lore contradicts that in multiple places. So I was... My opinion on this one is just simply interesting choice. Yeah, I I would be very interested um, to see where they go with it. I mean, the, the phrasing hmm. does very much come off like Shin Yang does do it deliberately, um, yeah. which could be the case. Like, it could be hmm. shit. I, I will say I would not be surprised if they end up saying that there's a narrative that after the Great War or the, the Cataclysm, Shin Yang went around and either was drawing Dar and Chaos out of creatures, and if he couldn't, he just it made them go extinct because he wanted to purify Grand Cathay. That seems like something he would do. Seems um, like a legit story as well. Yeah, um, so, yeah, you could definitely do something like that. So that that would might be what they lean into. And then no, I don't think Shin Yang had any children before meeting Kui Yin. Um, if if he did, well, he might have had like just basic bitch dragon children, but if he did, he doesn't seem to have cared. For, yeah, he doesn't seem <laughs> to have cared for them at all. Um, yeah, they certainly wouldn't have been shapeshifters in the same way that uh, his later kids are. Yeah, like, um, his relationship. I think quite it's is quite deeply distinct. unlikely he didn't have children beforehand, given his age, given his puissance, given his power, given his position. It seems exceedingly unlikely. Um, yeah. but that doesn't mean it did it did occur. It just seems unlikely. Yeah, that being said, if he did, they certainly do not matter to him in the slightest. <laughs> and uh, CB4, oh, thank thanks. you. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, appreciate that. I'd like to call out that one a little bit longer. I say I appreciate that because it is a conversation that I feel is often ignored by many because it is a difficult area to discuss for some people. Um, and, and so instead of discussing it, what people do is they just decide to ignore it, meaning that the issues are never brought up, never discussed, and people are left without any real information as to what the discussion could involve. So thus, you're just left loosely making your own choices up, and it's often based upon misinformation. All of this stuff is worthy of discussion and probably should be discussed. Now, are we the right people to do it? Not necessarily. (laughs) Okay, but I think we are in a position where we can at least open the door so that other people can discuss it and hopefully we'll come forward and discuss it because it should be. Because it's far too easy for very strong voices who are against discussing these issues to dominate and crowd out others who may have something that is arguably not just important to say but really cool to say because the warhammer world has so much in it that discussing this could be could add new fascinating and interesting characters that we could otherwise be too afraid to add to the background yeah and he worded it very very uh wonderfully there but i i would put it very bluntly as i'm a super greedy motherfucker and i want to read every possible story and every potential viewpoint so the more I can open the world up and hopefully maybe like inspire people out there who come from very different backgrounds to go, oh, Warhammer School, I should start writing for it. And like maybe mm-hmm. one day move their way into doing official source writing, the happier I will be. And it's purely yeah, for my self-enjoyment only. 
<laughs> yep, agreed entirely. Um, I, I'm quite aware of what my own experiences are. Thank you very much. And reading about those again and again and again is fine, but I like broadening my horizons as and where I can. Yep. Uh, learning line. Any chance we'll be going back to Eric Carl Franz? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. We're, we're going to yep, be talking yep, about yep, a lot yep, of yep. Damn straight. Depending on what happens as far as like the Chows of Change update, we'll probably be diving into some Aero Carl Franz stuff next week. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, all right. So, uh, next section ruled by dragons. Ooh, it's a big one. Um, this is a really big one. And there's a really big one because it says, I think it's right near the very beginning, one little bit that I really loved. And I'm going to read this bit out because this is a big one. Okay, now, let me just uh, adjust here because um, my glasses are rubbish. Right, so you ready for a sentence? Here we go. Yeah, go Cathay, for it. Cathay predates almost all human civilizations. Almost. Now, up until this sentence, Cathay predated all human civilizations because mm. they predate, get this, let's just make sure we understand this clearly, and they state it clearly here too, they predate the coming, well, not the coming of chaos, but yes, the cataclysm. The Cathay predates the cataclysm and does in these paragraphs. It's quite clearly stated that humans gathered around him and the first founding of Cathay occurs before the cataclysm. So the first human empire is already in place. It's not yet Grand Cathay. It won't be for thousands of years, but it's already in place. The dragon kids pop up before the cataclysm. They are already in place making Cathay and something predates this. And that is awesome because yeah. we don't know which one it's going to be it could be any of them now if you're going for the classic one it would almost certainly be in because uh as civilizations go the real world india has myths that go back hundreds of thousands of years if you go read into them and that i think would make for a super fascinating view on end end being the great foundation point potentially of many of the most ancient cultures or alternatively you want to go for a real world analogy you could drop down to the southlands and say that there are some truly ancient human empires and civilizations there that spread outwards as humanity moved elsewhere if you want to go for that form of diaspora from the African central, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you wish to start that way. But this single paragraph changes pretty much everything this book has already put into place and everything that Warhammer has put into place. This is not one of those accidental comments. That is as clear as crystal. We are going to have older civilizations that are human that predate the coming of chaos, which means if there was any doubt that humans are one of the oldest species on uh, the Warhammer world, it's now gone. That there, there is no doubt. They're as they are the same as the elves. They're the same as the dwarves. They are as old, and their civilizations. In fact, I'm going to go further. They're older than the dwarves. We already have mm. quite clearly marked in black and white in here that the dwarves were living in caves and were idiots come the coming of um, uh, chaos. The ancestor gods came down and went, hey, dwarf dude, the here's a bunch of stuff. Let's go down, going underground. And they went down beneath the surface. But by this point, humans already have massive empires, at least two, one of which is Grand Cathay to be. Cathay, or whatever they decided to call it in its most initial discovery with our dragons sitting over it, the dragon kids coming a bit later, and all the humans gathering around them underneath their protection, particularly as chaos come in. But we have another one somewhere. And that, to me, is an extraordinary shift. We're basically saying that in some respects, humans are not just as old as the other species. They predate them. Their empires are older than them. Even the high elves living in their uh, idyllic version of some form of heaven over in Ulthuin don't really have the same foundation within the Warhammer world as humanity. Humanity has gone from being the young race that rises up and has the adaptability to survive and bring about the end of the world, really, with Archeon. Yay! Um, but the adaptability to rise up and survive while the other species fade and die away, so the old being replaced by the new, the kids taking over from the grandparents or the, kid, the adults before them, they have completely changed from that. They are now the prime species on the planet. And it's a massive rewrite, a total tonal shift. And it doesn't feel like it with just a few words, but this is kind of huge right at the beginning of cafe yeah i also love that they leave it ambiguous as far as like who it is they're talking about mm. um which hopefully they might explore with future books whether it be end 
or maybe like a human civilization that once dominated large portions of the Southlands, which would make sense. Um, that then fell maybe during the cataclysm and Nehekara is like the survivors of that war having gone further north. Um, there's a lot of potential fun to explore there. Um, the other section yeah. for Grand Cathay that just my mind. <laughs> leaps out at me, which is so exciting, is that, of course, they talk second about... Paragraph? Uh, yeah. Yes, second paragraph? Yes, second paragraph is insane. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, I will say, first paragraph, I love that they confirm that... They just flat out confirm that Cathay is the most populous realm. Yep. Like, a lot of On. people... Easy to assume, but it's important for them to say it. Um, so I gl I'm glad that they fully call out that Cathay is like the largest human nation in population mm -hmm. and nowadays probably in size. Um, and uh, then the second paragraph is nuts. It's just nuts. It talks about the Kingdoms of End. It talks yep. about the Snakemen of Koresh. Yay! Uh, very exciting. Elven pirates, Nipponese invaders, and then most exciting to me, ancient enemies from beneath the Jade Sea. Fucking fishmen! <laughs> we got fishmen! Love it! So, cut a long story short, this paragraph um, brings into established Warhammer lore now many of the things that have been hinted at in Total War for some time as well. Um, and Total War has been saying it may or may not discuss in its various quotations running throughout the game. They are now very much brought into Warhammer 2. And I think it's fair to just take a pause and realize how much of an impact that Total War has made not just on the old world, but on Games Workshop as a whole. They have completely changed their stance. We would not have this game if not for Total War. I'm calling it out straight. Total War is popular. Even when it's at its most shouted at by its, very, its fan base, <laughs> it's still making money hand over fist. Even when Creative Assembly may be having issues with one thing or another, Total War is still doing freaking great. That being the case, we have got ourselves the old world, and this is the impact that it has. We have Grand Cathay brought into the core setting. We have a completely re-envisioned version of Kislev, and we have mm. mentions of societies that Total War has suggested they may go towards at some point or another. It doesn't matter if they do or not, but not only mentioned, but mentioned in the same way as they're mentioned over in Total War. We are basically almost aligning those two games, the old war with Total War, and trying to make sure that if you happen to be a Total War fan out there, the version of the old world that you're reading here kind of matches it. It's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of it's it's interesting to look back, especially from a Total War perspective, looking at the history of Total War, where the first two games, you can really tell that Games Workshop was very much kind of like the distant stepfather that would only chime in when it was convenient. Hmm. Um, but then when we get to Warhammer 3, seeing how this reflects everything in the game. And I mean, just looking at the most recent article they put out this past week about the new Cathay units. You can see Games Workshop's fingerprints all over it. Like Games Workshop is putting out public statements through Creative Assembly right now, yeah, which is because fair. Games Workshop is deeply involved in what's going on within the studio to the point that, which I'm I'm glad that CA is able to blame them for when they don't they're not able to do things the public wants. Like when everyone's like, oh, we want Zongors with beaks, you know, we want the AOS Zongors. And Games Workshop is the one who steps in and goes, no, those are different kinds of Zongors than the ones that exist in the old world. The old world ones yeah. are different. We don't want them to have beaks because we want them to be distinct. Um, which is like, okay, but I, I think it's still a bit of a weird decision, but I can appreciate that. Cool, whatever, let's move on. Hmm. Um, and it, it's, it's very weird, to be honest, it's very weird seeing Games Workshop so directly involved in a video game. Um, they don't do that. Yeah, they don't. Um, and... Uh, they, they just don't. Um, I'm, you're speaking to someone who has been on the licensing side, as in dealing with a Games Workshop license and making it happen. Games Workshop, they're very interested to see what you create, but they don't involve themselves with the creation. They basically say what you can and can't do. And if you're unsure what you can do, you just ask them. They say, yes, you can do that. No, you can do that. You go away, you make it, and you give it to them to approve. You don't go to them and say, I'd like to make this, please. And have them say, we'll make it for you back with you in a week. That's not how it works. Instead, they just go, yes, go make it and we'll see if we like it or not. So off you go and you make your thing. I've done that more times than I care to mention. But here, it's very different. And the impact it's made on the Old World book is evident. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the Dragon Emperor section. Uh, this one, we covered most of this in yeah. earlier videos about the history. There's not a lot of new here. It gets a little more into talking about what Yin and Yang are which is quite mm -hmm. nice where it talks about Yang is specifically the power of light, heaven, and fire, 
and the Moon Empress embodies Yin, which is the power of shadow spirits and night. Uh, I will say I love that description. Uh, I love the lore of Yin so much because it does such a good job. And we see this in Total War, but in the lore, one of the things that is kind of easy to lose is people to think, oh, darkness is bad or like mm. evil and it's chaos and stuff. Yeah. It's really nice to see Yin lean very heavily into things that we often consider bad. Shadow, spirits, and night. I mean, that's literally <laughs> spooky things, dead things, and mm. darkness. But they're good. They are yeah. They are things to be valued and cherished and are one of the strong halves of Cathay, which is awesome. I love that theming very, very much. Um, yep. It also leads very much into how mysterious the Moon Empress is because those are those are literally the elements of mystery being shadow spirits and uh, night. Like those are the most mysterious things from a very fundamental, almost elemental perspective, um, which is what makes, frankly, Yen so much more exciting than Yang. <laughs> Yang's very pompous and loud, which is great. But Yen really yeah. has a lot, all the, yes, has spice. all the spice. Um, yeah. And so but, I broadly agree here. Now, on a lower perspective, there's very little to say for me, at least, um, about this because it's not more about how much have they actually ported over from Total War and what tweaks have they made to try and build the story that they're currently making. But beyond that, in terms of contradictions, you're not really going to see much here because there isn't really any lore that's worth mentioning for Cathay that already exists within Warhammer. So you just have to look outwards towards a game like Total War to try and figure out exactly which bits they've used and which bits they haven't. But broadly speaking, they've just copy control, uh, control C, control V. Mm. Um, as they basically just control C and V their way through it and copy pasted the core of it, including even <coughs> the art at the very top, which again comes from them. Um, yep. that this is art that was created um, for creative assembly. So I think it's fair to say that uh, this is this is total war. I fight, I, I'm very amused by this. Yep. That being said, then we get to the next page. <laughs> and it's, is, it's a perfect setup for it, wasn't yeah, it? Which is Ooh. where they completely <laughs> take, uh, they take a hard left from total war into something genuinely new, which is exciting, which is the empty, empty throne. throne. So here we get that we are in the, we are in, and there is actually a campaign in total war Warhammer three that you can play. That's based on this called the time of darkness and disharmony. That's what we're in right now is the time of darkness mm -hmm. and disharmony. Mm -hmm. um, but this actually explores what that looks like. And it's very exciting where it talks about mm -hmm. that without mom and dad, the empire is falling into complete chaos. Uh, Grand Cathay is a mess because every like it talks about how magistrates are rebelling, criminals are everywhere, bandit gangs are growing powerful. Uh, it it names all the dragon children of that. Yuan Bo is stuck in Wei Jin and is struggling to try and not let Grand Cathay fall apart uh, because he can't be in the central provinces where he normally likes to be. Uh, he is stuck at home on Dad's throne, which is empty trying to hold together the bureaucracy of Grand Cathay. Meanwhile, it talks about everybody's favorite fail daughter, is my favorite description I've ever seen of her, um, which is Yin Yin, the sea dragon, which I love I that love while all the other dragons are trying to maintain Cathay, Yin Yin's trying to invade people. <laughs> Yet I love the way she's described. Yin Yin... Uh, her treasure fleet's traveling east, south, and west in search of gold and glory. This lady, it, like, she is, Yin Yin is, in many ways to me, hilarious, because she's kind of the most human of the dragons, despite the fact I'm pretty sure the way she's portrayed, she would probably hate anyone that said that, because um, she is arrogant as fuck, it feels like. But, like, she's literally trying to invade people and going off on treasure hunting missions, because she's on the ocean. She doesn't have to worry about any of this bullshit. Like she guards all the mm -hmm. coasts where everything's great and awesome. Um, and the fact that she's actively trying to send out fleets for glory while the rest of Cathay is struggling, she could be helping stabilize the empire. And instead she's doing her own shit, which is awesome. That is a great portrayal of a character. Yeah, I'm very um, keen to see what they do with her because um, uh, she's kind of my favorite. Um, she puts a smile on my face whenever I read extra bits about her, um, particularly because there is so much potential for that character to be something more than they're simply portraying her as in some quarters as a giant failure. And I'd like to see that be realized in a different way. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Like and then that. we get uh, Li Dao down in the south uh, yeah. talking about that he's trying to protect against invasions from End and Koresh, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are very eager to see the Kingdoms of End and the not Snakemen of Koresh and see that they are offensive. Um, mm -hmm. They are trying to actively attack Grand Cathay and Li Dao's fighting them. Of course, then there's the mention of the Monkey King hi mm -hmm. hiding in the Mountains of Heaven, which is always very exciting. Everyone's very <laughs> eager to see Monkey! Um, yeah. And then in the uh -huh. West, uh Zhao Ming the Iron Dragon indulges himself. I love that portrayal of Good him. Word. Um, where it really gives off the idea that he is insular, he's not really paying attention to what's going on in Wider Cathay, mm -hmm. he's just hanging out in Shenyang with his experiments and his alchemy. And uh, it also speaks to gold magic as a whole, as well, which I quite like. Yeah, Indulgent. so th that show of what all of the dragons are up to, which Mao Ying gets her own paragraph, which we'll go into in a second. Yep. Um but I love the portrayal of all the dragon kids and what they're trying to do and showing that Cathay, this is an exciting time to open with Cathay as a playable faction when we get around mm -hmm. to that in two or three years, uh, is that they are in a rough spot. And it's not necessarily because they couldn't unify, but because all of the children refuse to, which I really like. Like, it's not necessarily that they're being invaded by some unstoppable threat yet. Um, but instead that they're infighting, they're squabbling. Yeah, they basically turned Grand Cathay as we know it from Total War into the Empire. Now, that may sound like a very odd thing to say, but the Empire is in its Dark Ages. It's at a point where it's broken with infighting. It has separated into several discrete groups. And loosely speaking, Cathay is in the same place. It may be the largest empire of humanity that speaks with one voice, supposedly. But in truth, it's broken by infighting. And 200 years of, let's say, not having mum and dad there have caused them all the old bitternesses and rivalries to slowly but surely manifest until it's reached the point where mum and dad plan is secondary to their own concerns and that i think speaks a lot i really like it as a setup because it also speaks to the disharmony that is brought when each one of the great incursions of chaos come and that disharmony is made manifest in cathay with its story they haven't tried to say cathay is immune to this stuff it's better than everyone else it's just as broken and as fractured as everywhere else in the world when as of cool eventually does his big huge attack and one presumes that mom and dad might have something to say about that. Yeah. And the other, the things that I really like about this is it sets up the big mystery of where mom and dad are. And mm -hmm. of course, in Total War, we know they come back at the mm -hmm. end of this era. Um, mm -hmm. they, they come back like almost immediately after the battle, uh, the gates of Kislev. But we also don't, we also have not had it revealed why they why? Um, yeah. and what they found where they went, ah, it's time to go home now. Um, and the other thing that's very exciting and also, I think, pull, pu plays false to Games Workshop's f supposed future plans of never bringing back the legacy races. For those that don't know, the big bad for Grand Cathay during the time of our Darkness and Disharmony, which is hinted at here, ends up being the Monkey King. But it's not the Monkey King that's actually the problem. It's the Skaven. Hmm. The Skaven, a lot of people wonder, like, oh, what are the Skaven up to in the old world? And from the timelines we have, not a lot. Like, they, they are mostly involved in Civil War up until pretty much uh, the Battle of the Gates because that's when the Great Ritual happens that summons the Great Horn Rat into the world and they get reunified. But in the Total War timelines, one of the things we find out is that Clan Eshin actually makes a huge power play and they manage to convince the Monkey King to invade Grand Cathay, but his Monkey Warriors are reinforced by a horrifically massive army of Skaven that successfully take over Wei Jin and the Celestial City, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I cannot wait to see. Like it's the idea, a, an awesome story in and of itself. Yeah, so I I am super excited for that storyline. Um, hell, if that ends up being the way the Skaven are made replayable again, that would be such an exciting new place to see the Skaven. Yep. is working alongside the Monkey King and invading Grand Cathay, which would allow the Skaven to be used in a light they've kind of never really been seen in a long time of being like a full-on invasion force across an entire nation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like like being able to see the Black Plague, but it being a playable campaign instead of just a Black Library book, which is yep, super yep. exciting. Yep, agreed completely. Um, I could not be more excited for everything that this entire section offers. Um, and... As a general outside view looking in, this is, as I've said already, Total War 
changing Warhammer. Um, and we have an entirely new faction now, which we're going to get to use. And the stories that Total War Warhammer have offered are almost certainly being reflected back into the old world too. So if you're a Total War fan out there wondering, you know, how much does the lore match? Well, the answer is really, really, really closely now. Where beforehand, I would almost certainly have said, anything that happens in a computer game, take it with a pinch of salt. Because really, it's something that could happen in the Warhammer world, but almost certainly won't be mentioned in any of the games. It's just another one of those side stories. But in this case, no, 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 actually, the version of the old world, and indeed the Warhammer world as a whole, is presented inside Total War, is getting ported over, and obviously reimagined for the needs of old world the game and probably if we ever get the role-playing side that will be reimagined again for the needs of those games but that doesn't really matter the lore that you know is very much now going to be the lore that they're using and that's kind of cool yep and then the last section uh which isn't really a lot of new information is just explaining what the great bastion yeah. is yeah um and like how it was uh you know the the very very basics of what it is how it was made how where it stretches from all that stuff uh, if you're familiar with the Total War stuff about it, it's nothing new. But if you've never heard about it, you know, it's a nice little summary. Yeah. Um, but, I don't think there's uh, anything particularly worth looking there uh, at. It was just, yep, the Great Bastion, it's a thing. Yeah. The, the, thing that, the thing that I do wish they had kind of mentioned about it that I love a lot about it in Total War is talking about that it's, it, like, it mentions that the Celestial Dragon and his children all pour their magic into the wall to reinforce it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I love that they talk about in Total War is that the big thing about that is that allows it to literally be a wall against not just the physical threat of chaos, but the magical, magical and spiritual effect. threat of chaos, mm -hmm. where the the winds of magic cannot just blow effortlessly into Grand Cathay. Instead, the Celestial Dragon gets to siphon them into the Wuxing Compass, uh, which is a pretty big deal. But... That is the end of that section. So we can get caught up on some super chats. And then it's time for magic lore. Oh, I'm looking forward to this so much. Let's do our super chats. Well, um, you're, uh, after you fish them out, I'll do a quick go subscribe to uh, Lore Master Sotek. But I'll wait till afterwards. Just be prepared. I'm going to tell you to do this. <laughs> Yuan Bo <laughs> has to stir, has to sit on the empty golden throne. Yuan Bo the Sigilite. Yeah, uh, quite. Yeah, luckily Yuan Bo uh, is going to survive this ordeal a little bit better than Malkador did his. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Darkness and Disharmony, Mom and Dad <laughs> painting minis. Oh, Mom the Terracotta Dad, Armors. <laughs> watch, watch, it turns out they just they just went on a date night and they're like, we left we left for five minutes. <laughs> Have you seen the video yet, Sotek? Which there's video? a video. Uh, there's a video. I'll show it to you later because oh, it's okay. hilarious. <laughs> uh, if not for Total Thanks War for one, one, I would not know about Warhammer at all. Yep. Well, I think this is exactly why Cathay is the way that Cathay is. Um, because Total War is a gigantic advert for the Warhammer world. And I don't think Games Workshop realized when they gave the license over how much of an advert it would be. It's so big that the chances that we don't get ourselves a 40k version drilled down into our eyeball eyeballs within a week is almost nil. It's coming. And exactly the same way that old world is coming because of this it's it's huge actually huge and you wouldn't be here if not for it and i'm delighted to see you here luring lion you rock and thank yep. you very much yep thank you very much uh Aranthiel, uh so i'm aware we don't know if this exists currently but might we see cathay get dragon turtles even with them being the progenitors of monks uh and getting a character in total war i really want them i mean anything's possible um, yeah. Un unfortunately, the only answer I can give you is I don't know <laughs> because we haven't seen anything mentioned about that yet. I agree completely. Um, it's it. I don't know. Um, maybe um, we'll see. Um, is it something that could occur? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I hope it does. Uh, Dragon Turtles would be awesome. A lot of people love Dragon Turtles, especially after yeah. Avatar: The Last Airbender came out. Um, Hammond, this is individually the best rewrite to date. Uh, it is indeed. The, I mean, it is the biggest one because they have quite clearly stated that Cathay is not the oldest human empire. And that's mental. Yeah, it, it, it really is. It uh, really is. Bone, another question. So now it's confirmed real stinky is the only hack one there and there are no other than what will be the their generic we'll lords. See. We'll, we'll probably see in the next week or yeah. two. Um, I would guess it's probably maybe going to be some kind of like 
Ungol character, maybe a, like a like a Kassar horse archer character type thing. I don't know. Um, we'll see. It, yeah, we'll we'll have to see. It's not it's yeah. not gonna it's probably not gonna be a wizard that I feel confident on. Um, but what it will be, I don't know. Um, we'll catch the rest of the stream later. Super good stream as always. Well, thank you, Nils. Oh, thanks, Nils. Appreciate Nils. that. Appreciate All right. it. So, All right, before we go, I have a couple of things to say. Number one. Uh, we know for a fact that everyone that's watching us just now has not subscribed to our various channels. We would like to call <laughs> you out right now and say, what have we done wrong? How have we hurt you so? Please <laughs> subscribe. Go right now. <laughs> click the subscribe button because, because we're here doing our best, begging you. Please, please just press subscribe. It makes an enormous difference for us. It makes almost no difference for you <laughs> on your side. But it makes a huge difference for us on how YouTube or Twitch or anything else handles our various algorithms. So if you are out there watching and thinking, gosh, can I be bothered? Please answer that with a quick yes. In particular, there's two things to call out on that. Number one, I'm about 300 subscribers away from hitting 5K on YouTube. And when we hit 5,000 over on YouTube, there is a certain video that a certain person over to this side intends to release. And it's a big one. Certainly something to lose your head over. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, people <laughs> haven't been waiting like three or four years for it at this point. Yeah, um, quite. So, quick yeah. head taker, the video is coming soon. We're only 300 subs away from that. And more importantly, we're only around about 25,000 subs away from, uh, what, 100k over in your side? Yeah, There's at least, something like yeah, that. something like that. I'm making a random guess here. So, <laughs> that being the case, I'm sure there are at least 25,000 of you out there right now who could just press click. And I will end with the thing that I said I'd talk about earlier. I'm not going to go into this, though, because it's not what the stream is about. But I have a new game coming out called Dark Deeds, written by Andy Chambers, who, if you know your Warhammer lore, mm -hmm. um, wrote another tons Andy. of stuff. <laughs> another Andy. Yes, indeed. He's a big skaven master over there. By Mark Gibbons, who, if you know your Warhammer lore, wrote, drew just about every single picture that is iconic from Warhammer through the fourth and the fifth edition of the game. Just think of that Sword Master of Horus or that Dragon Prince of Kalidor. Mark has done a gorgeous job of illustrating all the cards in this one. And you, right now, can't buy it. But it is coming soon. I am going to give you a page you can go to because I'm not publishing this personally, but me pals over at Modifius are. And they've got a page where you can go to right now and click a button and find out more about it. I'm also going to give you a little preview because I can, because it's, you know, it's our company and we can just do whatever we want. We're building a website right now. So if you want to go and look at the website before it's actually released publicly, you can do so. And if you want to know about Dark Deeds, pop over there. More importantly for us, if you do want to support us building stuff, um, making our own games and doing roleplay stuff and all that business, okay, if you just subscribe over at Modifius, even if you're not sure if you want to buy the game, it makes a huge difference for us. So popping over there and asking for more Dark Deeds news would be super nice. That, by the way, is our... I can't believe we've got... A, uh, I can't believe I got a website page and everything all going there so that's the thing okay <laughs> you've got links there please do check them out whether you do it just now or after the stream it, it will actually potentially change my life um in terms of where it goes and will potentially mean that we make more cool stuff and we like making stuff because we enjoy it so i've now done that let's get to the bit i'm actually looking forward to um although it was quite fun to well, talk the last about thing Darcy. i'll say is please if you're also sitting here and hanging out hit the like button leave a comment down below because it helps algorithm god which is a greedy evil thing but unfortunately we have to appease it um, yeah 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 we do um actually um i'm gonna do a small interruption but this is actually about what we're about to talk about and say that it would be super easy to skip all the way to the magic section but there is one tiny point i'd like to call out which is on page number 218 so on page number 218, it discusses Geheimisnacht. And there is a lore change here. This is not the first time we've had a lore change for Geheimisnacht, but I'm going to call it out anyway. Geheimisnacht, as it was presented, I can't remember which chaos book did it, was basically any night that Morsley bros fool. And they said, that's Geheimisnacht, the night of mystery. That was a complete rewrite of what came before. And what came before was Geheimisnacht was one day in the year, it's right in the middle of summer, that Morslieb was always full. So Geheimis Tag, the day, became Geheimis Nacht, the night when Morslieb rose full and bad guys did bad guy things. But it wasn't the only day in the year when this occurred. On New Year's Day, Hex and mm. Stag, it also occurred on Hex and Nacht. So you had two days in the year where good old Morslieb always rose full. So 
when I did the fourth edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, I had to send a quick ping over to Games Workshop and say something along the lines of this. In the Chaos book over here, it says that Gaimus Nacht is any old time that Mors leaves pool. That contradicts everything that came before. It's a castaway line. Can I ignore it and return it back to Gaimus Nacht and the Hexen's Nacht the way it should be? And the reply was, yeah, absolutely, of course. There's no doubt about that. That's what it should be. They've just used the terminology here slightly <laughs> wrong. It won't be a problem. To which I replied, thanks very much. I will do that. So I wrote it directly in that uh, Mors Lieb is only full, certainly, on two days, but could be full at any other time because Mors Lieb is erratic. Page 218 contradicts this. It says that Geheimis Nacht is the only night. Now, there's two reasons, maybe three, why this occurred. First, most writers only know about Geheimis Nacht. They don't know about Hexenstag or Hexensnacht purely because it's a more obscure reference. It wasn't a, you, originally, but it became more obscure when the Go Trek and Felix novel focused, very first short story, focused mm. on Geheimis Nacht. So one of the very first short stories said Geheimis Nacht is a thing, and almost everybody that wrote Warhammer read that one story. So they focused on Geheimis Nacht as being the only time when this occurred. And whenever someone that knew the broader lore came along and said, you are aware of Hexes Nacht, aren't you? That's like a whole other day where this happens. They went, oh, oh, cool. Oh, oh, right. I didn't realize that. I'll, I'll maybe add that in later. That could be what happened here. I think it's quite likely that's what happened here. But it's quite possible also that they might have, and I really doubt this, but they might have a story planned where they intend to have Geheimis Nacht be the only day that it occurs, but post as of our cool, it becomes a thing on two days. Ooh, now that would, that would be that sweet. would be like spicy that. and cool. Now, personally, this is what I do if I had this book and I was just taken over. I'd go, ah, shit, someone's written something that they probably shouldn't have written. I'd go over to them and say, what are you doing here? They'd say, what do you mean? What am I doing here? It's Geheimis Nacht. It's more. Yeah, what about Hexen's Nacht? And they go, oh, is that a thing? And then you'd show it to them. They'd show the book and you'd show where Hex's Nacht is a thing on the calendar. <laughs> and they'd go, all right. Oh, fuck. Well, we fucked up there, didn't we? And I said, it's not a fuck up. We will turn this into a story. So I would turn this mistake into a purposeful choice. That's what I do if I was in control because you could tell a super cool story about the world getting one step closer to midnight. The end times are one step closer to definitely occurring where beforehand it was one night in the year where it happened. Now it's two and things have gone wrong for the old world and the Warhammer world as a whole. So that's one way of uh, changing that. But I thought I'd call that one out because it is legitimately a change in the lore, both of old Warhammer where they said that Geheimis Nacht was any day it rose full, and also of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4 and all the other editions of... In fact, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is a, in, as a whole, where two nights are mm. full moon nights. So that's worth calling out because it's a significant lore change. It isn't magic, but we're about to hit that right now. Yeah, you all of things to find gifts, by the way. Um, all right, so the realms of magic. So... <laughs> uh, the the first section um, basically just goes over some history they kind of actually talked about earlier in the book where it basically explains what the cataclysm was. Uh, it talks. What's interesting though is it does talk a little bit more. It's interesting to me how much focus the geomantic web is getting uh, in the old world. Like they talk about yeah. it a lot, and here yeah. they talk very specifically about how it shattered. They talk about the world shaping engines of the old ones, which is a kind of a folly call. Funny call out to Age of Sigmar, where world shaper engines are being actively used again, um, but mm -hmm. by the Lizardmen uh, or the Seraphon, as they're now called. But um, so, but none of this is like super new from everything we've already talked about. But Salvation, which is the next series of paragraphs, has yeah. the really fun notes about that. A, it once again reinforces, and I love that Elven Waystones were merely some kind of. Uh, redneck engineering additions onto something far <laughs> older and far more powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, I love this section because, yes, it does that. Um, I will call out one other thing about this entire section as well. It kind of undermines much of the history that they write earlier in the book and feels like it was written by a different hand in that the stress throughout this is elves, 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 elves save the world, elves, elves, elves rock, elves see magic, elves do this, elves, also elves rock. 
By the way, have you met my new elven emperor? He's the best. My new elven king. Elves kick ass. Without the elves, <laughs> there'd be no magic. Without the elves, there'd be no colors of magic. Without elves, there'd be nothing. Elves. Yeah. yeah. It, you can buy them from your local shop for $19.99. That's, yeah, that's what it feels like. It's the um, same. It's the exact same asshole that wrote the Malarian section. That's that's who it has to be. It's that it's, same guy. <laughs> it's it's actually hilarious just how uh, much stress is placed on the elves when they counteracted this earlier in the book and went out of their way to say the dwarves were doing shit, the lizardmen were doing shit, Cathay was doing shit. You know what? The whole world was trying to do something to stop the cataclysm, and here, no. No, it was the elves. Without the elves, nothing would have happened. The elves fixed everything. Thanks, elves. We love you, elves. It's um, it's interesting. Yeah, but I will say, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of skip ahead to the section that I find interesting because the the where, where are you going to? Let's I'm see going, you're going to, to colors of magic. Okay, colors of uh, magic. Yeah, like, that's where the, I the go first, to as well. The first three sections are just rehashing stuff we've already seen in this book. Yeah, pretty um, much. Um, the, uh, it's it's. If you're going to go read it yourself, you're not going to see anything that is especially new here, although they do sort of overwrite what came earlier in the book. So that is worth saying. This feels like it's a separate hand, but it's the colors of magic. Holy shit balls! is this interesting. Yeah, so this section is, this is a, I, we, we touched on this a little bit, I think, in the first or second stream, but this is a fucking colossal change to how Huge. magic functions. Um, Massive. Yeah, because what this basically establishes is that before the coming of chaos, um, when the old ones showed up and they started like bringing magic, a significant amount, shall we say, of magic into the world through the polar gates, it was only high magic. That was the only form of magic that existed. And because, and one of the things they actually call out that I really, really like is they talk about that the elves kind of struggled to use it a bit. Because there was only this very sophisticated form of magic, and then after Chaos showed up, there was only Dar, where all the magic was being horribly com compressed and corrupted and all this other stuff. But once the Vortex was created and the, the laws of magic kind of shattered in a sense, um, there was now from the... One of the things... Hey, there are two things I like about this. That now there were suddenly eight perceivable wins which i do love that this kind of implies that there's more than eight wins it's just yeah. that the elves are only keenly aware of eight <clears throat> and only keenly aware of eight at this point as well it suggests that there are multiple winds of magic that go beyond that in the same way that we as humans can only perceive certain colors but we know that uh, our color range goes well beyond the visual spectrum both at the lower end and the reds and higher end as we go up into our ultraviolets et al um it's that's a fascinating mention, but that's not new lore. There have been more than eight winds of magic in multiple sources over the course of time, and some of them have even been named in some sources. Go check our winds of magic stream if you want to go and take yep. a, a deeper dive into that, because our winds of magic stream goes into this with some detail. There is definitely more than eight winds if you go into the deeper lore, but eight winds is generally where we start. They are the eight elemental winds that all elves are open to when they're getting taught and here we find out where they came from <laughs> yeah yeah and one of the things i love about this in the second paragraph is it actually talks a lot about how it used to be that when the elves wanted to cast magic and it implies the way the slon cast magic is that if you wanted to cast a spell you had to basically reach into high magic and pull out the threads of the winds you wanted to use which to be fair would be really hard like that's basically you're like basically looking at a perfectly balanced stream of magic and when you're casting a spell you're needing to reach out and only pull out the pieces you intend to use which is going to require an incredible amount of finesse but now that magic has broken apart now all of the components of magic are kind of lying bare and it makes it much much easier to just kind of grab the pieces that you want which is mm -hmm. what allowed the elves to jump into ascendancy which I actually really like because that speaks to how the Salon approached magic being so different from how the elves approached magic. And also makes the Salon, A, a lot more scary and also explains why the Salon would have struggled so much with what Chaos did to magic, which I like a lot. What I found particularly interesting, um, after that, they then make it quite clear that the elves, as they did the redneck hacking of the geomantic web, 
as they started thrusting down menhirs into this geomantic web to create the vortex, they were ultimately responsible for hacking off the great cover, shall we say, that sat over high magic. They splintered it off and revealed all of the winds that lay within it. Like it was a watch that you took the face off and you could start using all the working bits that lay underneath. They were responsible for the colours of magic. They basically fragmented the winds themselves along with the good old help of chaos by attempting to rid the world of chaos they added an extra layer of chaos to what was supposed to be the pure magic that came through from the polar gates this is not just new it's massively new because the magic as we understood it so this is the magic of calador when he's setting up the vortex in the first place is not mar marked as being high magic or color magic or whatever it's just marked as being the same freaking magic um and in the older stories in particular they take stress and time to make it clear that the magic is so powerful that anarian doesn't want to lose it mm. it's an essential component of fighting against the hordes of chaos he doesn't want the vortex to happen and he has a strong argument against it and they go do it anyway but he has a massive argument against it because all of the great power that they have access to will be diminished and what they're saying here is you know what yeah screw that what actually happened was the elves always had it tough with magic anyway um and by creating the vortex they now have it easier suggesting that calador is shit in comparison to the later <laughs> elven wizards which is so contrary to the lore that it's almost crazy. But then you could take a different angle and say, you know what, Kalador, because he mastered high magic, he would perhaps, if he came into this world, master all anew. Yeah, well, that might be the case. But if he came out into this world, he would not know how to use all of those fundamental separate wins to begin with. There would be a learning process. This whole thing is not just rewriting elves, rewriting magic, rewriting the story. It's basically taking everything that has been written and almost... 30 years worth of discussion about the winds of magic and said, you know what? We don't care what it said before. It's now this. It's fundamental. Is it bad? No, no, it's actually pretty cool. It's a nice story. It's speaking to how the elves not only fixed, but also broke. The elves didn't just resolve the vortex issue. They created entirely new issues, which empowered them and ultimately potentially brought about the end of the world. Um, I, mm. I love this section and everything it resolves. It creates a whole block of lore issues. If you're looking at a piece of lore to only incorporate what came before and add to it, this isn't it. This basically takes a gun to the old lore about the Winds of Magic <laughs> and shoots it dead and says, actually, it's this. The elves have gone from being a species that were fundamentally weakened by the arrival of the Vortex, a species that then moved into a period of high power to waning throughout because of the massive magics they had before that had been massively curtailed by the coming of the Vortex. They are no longer this. The elves' entire story has been turned pretty much up on its arse without, I think, the writer even being aware of what they've done. No longer is it the loss of magic that impairs the dragons. No longer is the loss of magic that impairs many of the creatures of chaos. The Anulai, for example, that sits in Ulthuin, it's magically active because of the vortex. And it's one of the reasons that there's more monsters and dragons and more active there than almost anywhere else in the Warhammer world because of the magic. Yeah, no, that's just not the case anymore. What came before was almost inaccessible. It was very difficult to use. The slan were using this shit and only a few others who were capable of it. None of this, ah, the great dragon can use his ear and has been able to use it from the beginning. There was no Azir in the beginning. There was just high magic. It's a complete rewrite of everything that we know. And hmm. for me, it's both fascinating because I can see what they were trying to do and also slightly horrific because all of the stories that have been told by Warhammer have now changed with a few short paragraphs if they stick with it. Because if they stick with this as magic, the whole story of the elves has changed. The stories of the dragons, as the elves understood them, not the new story, as we've now got from Cathay, but as the elves, they've changed. The stories of monsters and chaos, that's all changed. The whole point of the Anulai, that's changed. All of these tales need to be gently retold in a new way to make sense or just pushed aside. I am both fascinated and horrified by this part because I sort of love it. In fact, I go further. I kind of adore it. 
while simultaneously kind of hating it because it makes the elves so, so, so much less of a fading power because of the magic. Their own choices doomed their species. It caused them to break, to fragment. The mm. power that they once held was gone. The dark elves turned to dark magic. The high elves tried to grasp onto the power they had, eventually reaching some form of high magic. That's kind of cool, but they're fading. No longer. They're not fading. They've got better. They've got significantly better uh, across the board. Awesome. Yeah, one, one of the things that, yeah, the, the thing that I would say to me that really is interesting here is, and granted, I think this may be to, I don't mean this to sound rude. It's going to sound rude, but I don't mean it rude. <laughs> um, that uh, there, are, there are parts of this that I jump out it. at me is what I feel like are limitations of the author's writing ability of that. Mm. I think what the author was trying to imply, because the way I took it reading this is that it almost seems to imply that before the coming of chaos, there's a lot of magic, but it's a very pure, strictly like controlled, balanced, perfect thing. Uh, and it's like, oh yeah, there are elves that can wield it, but even the most powerful of elves, it was, it was, it it took a lot of very, it took a lot of care. It took mm. a lot of precision, the likes of which is not needed anymore. It's possible to be much more clumsy. But what happens is that it, the books, um, the way it seems to imply it is that, or what I think the author was going for and the way I initially read it is that when the vortex is created, it almost leads to this situation where the polar gates fracture. And instead of it being like an open gateway where there's a balanced torrent of magic, it's instead like if you took a glass mirror and you punched it, and it's all fractured and there's all these sharp pieces where magic is coming out all chopped up and messy. And the elves, I do love that it says the elves did it on accident. They didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, It says though the elves had no By way accident. of knowing it. Uh, they goofed, which is funny. The elves, what they functionally managed to do is when this, this magic, instead of coming out in this purified torrent, it's instead being kind of torn on these jagged edges and coming out from the shattered gate as kind of a mess the mess is being pulled down and the, the way i initially read it it comes off like because it's a trickle of magic it's not this great torrent but instead more of a lighter flow that's being ripped apart as it's coming into the world and then going into the waystone network the elves are suddenly able to see all of the composite pieces when from the old one perspective, that was never supposed to be the case because there's so much, and it talks about this in the later chapter on the art of magic. Mm -hmm. There is so much more danger with oh, yeah. magic as it now is because now anybody can grab it. Anybody can manipulate it so long as they just have the ability of mage sight, essentially. Yeah, which is entirely random, um, which is very much in line with the existing lore. Um, so uh, as I say, there's parts of this I adore and i think your reading of it is in no way inaccurate um i do think that pretty much everything you're suggesting there is the case um while simultaneously adding the extra components that are quite clearly written in there um i actually sort of love it because they have both made sense of a thing in a different way and they started telling different stories with it and when we've got different stories that opens up new possibilities which i'm always up for um i really don't like messing with the um power of the elves too much i would have preferred to see that properly handled but it's such scant information in the paragraphs that when they actually go to detail this later you might find that what appears to be the case in an initial reading will be gently smoothed over on the later one um you know how it is yeah if, um, I, if I was talking to this author the big thing i would have said to him is you need to make sure you properly elaborate in the colors of magic and art of magic section that there is le significantly less magic in the world because of what the elves did. That yeah. While it may be easier to control what's there, there's so much less of it that they're not capable of what they used to be. And he doesn't do that. So the, the reading... impact this makes on uh, magical entities. Yeah, yeah. Because, it, and that's where I think this kind of fails, is the only place yeah. where it addresses the lessening of magic is with the demons. demons. Where it's like, there are mm. a lot of demons and then now they're all gone where I would have really liked some more, I would have just liked another paragraph, which they could have easily fit. I would have liked one more paragraph talking about how the vortex screwed with, 
the dragons and all these other magical creatures mm -hmm. and how while the elves while they had to relearn this form of magic that in many ways is simpler they're also having to deal with a world that is fundamentally less magical the blood yeah. of the world is lessened so um if, if i was rewriting this yes i would do something similar to that but i would also i think because of the way that dragons have been discussed in many previous versions of them particularly with their tie to magic i would have had the magic be one of the reasons the old world came in the first place the gates were effectively great lenses that were used to concentrate and control this magic the fragmentation of the gates that's what causes the colors of magic to start fragmenting out into different directions much as you suggest with the shattering of that mirror that would have made a clearer more sensible story it would have also made a clearer story to the dragon emperors of Cathay um, well the dragons of Cathay and also why the dragon kids are still so vibrant and alive in comparison to dad because they're not dragons per se they're half dragon um, so they don't rely upon the winds of magic to the same degree. The winds of magic being a part of the Warhammer world gives an enormous um, impetus towards where Age of Sigmar is going to come from as well, where the winds of magic are intrinsic to the realms and exactly how the gods work over there. This is hmm. a special place. This is a fated place. And the winds of magic are an incorporated part of that. And to simply say they came about because some elves were fucking about with a geomantic network was for me an exceeding error massive error super cool and fun as a story but an enormous error to simply say that this is something that was created out of this mess no it should always have been there it was the point the old ones were there in the first place obviously because it's what becomes the case for age of sigmar so breaking that is breaking the links to age of sigmar and what makes that setting unique and also breaking the links to why the old ones themselves came as they saw the potential future for what the warhammer world was going to become and simply saying it was a bit of a you know oh it's because they hacked in some stones that's weak ass storytelling there should have been a better part of that yeah i th this section could have used a lot and it, it like it's obvious just from like the history section of the past two pages um yeah, I would have liked a lot if 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 there was ever a section in this book where they needed to be like, okay, we need our most careful and considerate author. He needed to be here and he wasn't. Yeah, uh, and it's painfully obvious. Is the is the only thing. I'm very curious what they're going to do with this going forward. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I think I'm we've also going to I'm also going to call out the titles: the art of magic and non art of magic. Yeah, you could have been a bit more original there <laughs> yeah i see what you're trying to do He's but it's trying. Mixos. that's exactly the sort of thing that i'd have come in as an editor afterwards and gone no don't do that it's it's not doing anything clever particularly with your foreign language readers who might actually have some uh issue with this um just yeah they might not even notice the difference it's a bit of a shame yeah uh for the art of magic they mostly just kind of mm -hmm. rehash what high magic is and how perceiving magic works and yada 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 uh, but this is where they do um, introduce the new lores of magic as we're going to get them presented when they discuss elementalism, illusionism, demonology, and the like. So this is where the new types of magic are uh, discussed. I don't think that talking about it now is worthwhile. I think while we go through each of the lores, that's the best place to do it. But I will drop in a, um, a simple point, and that is that they've chosen with the old world to go back to the original breakup for magic. And by that, I mean the magic breakup that you got in third edition Warhammer or in first edition Warhammer fantasy roleplay. Gone are the eight winds of magic. They may exist. They do exist. But they are no longer the yeah. core components that you're going to be using in the game. Instead, we're going all the way back to the third edition of Warhammer and the first edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, where they break up magic as illusionism, as elementalism, as demonology. But they add one extra one as well, two extra, actually. They also add dark magic, where previously dark magic was in first edition and third edition Warhammer, much more of a, a part of what was demonology and such like. And then it got its own thing added later when the winds of magic were created and added and changed everything. But here they've added dark magic as its own discrete thing. And they, of course, have also added warg magic in as well because they intend to use green skins. I do find it fascinating that they went back to the original lores that came with the first one because it's a, it's almost like a little nod to all of us old beardies who used to play those games well, back in the day. And I want to say, the more I've thought about it, the more it's like this kind of always should have just been what magic was because to be frank outside of the empire virtually nobody learns magic as the eight wins 
Yes. Like, that's just not how it works. The Empire has a very strict Hogwarts wizard school that enforces this policy because the elves made them do it. But if you go anywhere else in the world, their magic is going to be very, very different, with the exception of, like, Grand Cathay, where they're mm -hmm. only allowed to learn Azir magic. Um, uh, but it's, this makes so much more sense of like the magic in Araby isn't going to be based on colors. The magic of the beastmen is not going to be made on colors. The magic of like a lot of the, like the wood elves is not going to be based on colors. Like it's all this stuff of like, in it was always very strange looking back that the magic of the entire setting was dictated by the empire's specific understanding of how magic worked. And elves. And, um, because yeah. they, elves, they learned it from the elves. But yeah, even but the elves have got a like broader mixing, awareness. Yeah, mixing yeah, and doing totally. all sorts of crazy shit. They are. Um, and I find I find this both quite satisfying um, and uh, on a personal level relatively satisfying because I have had more conversations about what magic should be in the Warhammer world than you probably have days of your lives. I've done it so <laughs> much over the course of time. And I've done this with people in Games Workshop, people who've been writing for Warhammer since the very beginning. I had an enormous conversation with Graham Davis, for example, who is the person who was largely responsible for much of the Warhammer world as we know today. Um, he was a writer for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1, 2, 3, and 4, a great friend of mine, and he is the best. But Graham hates the color magic system because it categorizes things in such a fashion that he just doesn't like. He prefers the more... Um, fuzzy version that you got originally and that's what they brought back but it is such a fragmented part of the greater whole for example uh illusionism is effectively gray gone wrong understanding the gray wind but using other bits all over the place demonology is effectively heish gone wrong understanding the white wind but all the stuff that involves demons and all the rest of it gone wrong where's the gold wind where's my alchemy I should have alchemy in there. Elementalism, that makes loads of sense because that's bits of the blue wind, bits of the red wind, all the various elemental potentials. Jade went in there too, dram pulling out. But there's so much missing because they've returned but not thought about the greater picture. And the fact that they're going to need to add these later because alchemy is a thing that you're just not going to escape from no matter how hard you try. The same thing with the blue wind, which is uh, in parts of it, all about seeing the future. You're going to have all sorts of hags and weird things that can see the future or the past, which is mixtures of the purple wind and the blue wind together. They're missing here entirely. I imagine they're going to get added with time as we go through army lists and individual spellcasters can do their thing. But I think it's a real shame, not that they've done this. I think this is great, actually great. But it's a real shame they didn't hint at the greater picture. They basically said everyone is either a battle wizard who have studied for battle or they're one of these other things, which to me was really limiting because it's a really limited split. Yeah, well, and I will say that they the the way they word it is they do call out that these are the in the lands of men you have yeah. elementalist illusions and all just necromancers where's um, my alchemist yeah it it i a i i kind of wish they had done eight just to keep it kind of standardized yeah. the older stories um but i will say that i i do think it's very much gonna be one of those things they add to with time um yeah where this is just kind of what they ended up with of like all right we have kind of a balanced set go um, yeah so um, I, I'm going to call it out before we go into the individual ones that, uh, again, one of those ones where, you know, if I'd been doing things, I would have been very insistent right from the beginning that we reinforce where this game is going, which is ultimately Age of Sigmar, which means that as these eight wins manifest, now, no one might understand them as humans because they can't perceive these wins very well at all but some of them are exceedingly powerful in certain areas and they're going to manifest those powers and as they pull out from that wind more than the others it's going to manifest in certain ways alchemy is largely the gold wind but they're also doing other stuff with it or illusionism is largely the gray wind but they're also doing other stuff with it i would have had eight clear disciplines all of which are mixing and ma maxing the winds up in weird ways and doing stuff. That makes sense. It reinforces the world building that came before. It reinforces the world building that you're coming towards as well. And it also would have spoken to the original lore because you would have included your illusionism. You'd have included your elementalism. You'd have included your demonology. You'd have had all those things already written in. And anyone who's a fan of the ancient material would go, oh, my stuff is back. 
brilliant. Anyone who's a fan of the newer material would go, oh, the winds are broken and weird. That's cool. That would have been reinforced. But this does neither. All it does is say that old thing that came before. Yeah, that's what we should have. And in some respects, all it does is create forum wars. Yeah, well, and this to me, this smacks of we're not going to do what would make the most lore sense. We're going to we're explaining to you why we picked what we picked for the battle, your tabletop game. Yep. And that's all we're going to bother with because whatever. <laughs> yeah, um, um, it's somewhere where I think eight wins plus dark and not high because we'd leave high off till later. Eight wins plus dark would have been perfect. And that would have included your demonology. That included your necromancy with the purple wind. It would have been perfect. It would have been almost perfect. Yeah, because um, I mean, yeah. the book's weird. Like the fact that it has wa magic and high magic as two of these lores is very strange because those are very faction specific lores. They could have just gone off to their books. Yeah, um, and it, it, I, it it just smacks of like rules writers getting in the way of actually exploring the narrative better. But, uh, but I will say we've got what we have. I'm, I'm so, and I will also call out that I generally like it for all I can pick it apart easily. Yeah, I do like the way they describe wall magic. It makes me laugh of that. It talks about that orcs and goblins like don't even really seem aware of the winds of magic, and yet yep. they are brute forcing it um, somehow uh, into uh, pr a primordial force. I do like that wall magic. They go out of their way in this book to really suggest that and reinforce, I should say, not suggest, but reinforce. Wall magic is not magic as we understand it it's a weird ass psychic phenomena that affects magic but in and of itself is something different which is fun i also think for those of you who like merging your 40k and your warhammers together it actually provides a reinforcing pillar for that yeah all right yeah. Uh, i do want to okay. get caught up on some let's get on our super chats because we have yeah. quite a few come in there yeah uh i need to go back to how far yeah. back are we going there holy uh chameleon. here uh still loading uh would y'all do a dark deed stream or is there one already there isn't one already um we are going to be doing a few streams about it for if you're interested last night actually mark did quite a lot of chatting over in rookery publications about it it was just mostly about his design various choices it wasn't just about that it was about general stuff but i'm going to be playing the game and doing stuff online at some point um and maybe sotek and i will do something about it if we decide to do so who knows yeah, fun. But cut a long story short Go sign up. Yeah, please. I'm going to. <laughs> um, uh, Aaron Theol says, so might the new reason for the elves fragment is because of how powerful they became after the cataclysm ended, made them arrogant to the function well. So, yes. Um, yeah, and I, 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 yeah, what you're going for, I think the answer is essentially yes. Yes. And I think that what you're mm -hmm. suggesting there is a story that I would lean into to try and reinforce what the corrupted winds of magic can do in that they were flooded through with this new, let's say, ribboned version of what came before and have been using it for some time and opened themselves to corruption and an eventual fragmentation as we have our kin strife and dark elves and high elves and wood elves and all the rest of it um we can definitely build a story around that it's a different story it's a story that's already been told one way and we just put a slight tweak in it to make it be told another but absolutely that could be done yep mandatis i like the idea that the elves both ruined magic without realizing it while also making it more accessible to everyone and still are pining for a greater past glory that never really existed in the first place and yet they're in decline because of their own arrogant foolery. Broadly speaking, yes to all of that. Um, uh, one of the great joys of Warhammer is ensuring that um, all of your greatest successes don't just come at a cost, but ultimately are also your greatest failures. And the best writers for Warhammer understand that at a fundamental level. So when the great hero wins, it is, for one reason or another, undermined by the true intent of what's going on. And here is a perfect example of how you could tell those stories with the High Elves, with their attempts to fix everything and making enormous mistakes as they do so, often in their arrogance, but often also in their desperation, because it was a very, very difficult time. And mm. I think, yes, to all of that, and thank you very much again for that super chat super yeah appreciated. thank you for the generosity yeah i will agree yeah. i re i really like the portrayal the old world is leaning into heavily on in the older lore it always seemed much more strongly implied that the elves like knew exactly what they were doing and everything was yeah. very well done all the stuff but in this it almost it gives much more of that feeling of like 
you have like a facility that's run by a generator and you have a child that understands that elect understands electricity is a thing and they need electricity and the generator's broken and they're trying to fix it, but they're literally just a fucking kid and they have actually, no idea how this thing works. I'll go further with that and actually make it something that you can immediately and directly relate to. All right. All the nuclear engineers have just died. Go fix that plant. Yeah. And, and that's something you can do right now. Go try it out. Figure out in your head. How does this work? You have no internet and you have no manuals. But you know what it does because intellectually, you know, we all know what those plants are kind of doing. And some of us will know more. Some of us will know less. Some of us may even be gentle experts on parts of it. But we don't understand how that plant works. And then you've got to try and fix it so that it supplies energy for everyone. Away you go. And you're going to fuck up. It's going to go wrong. And I think that is exactly what it should have been for the elves. There's a reason that Inarian did not want this to happen. There has yeah. to be a really good reason or he's just an idiot. So he's not an idiot. The first Phoenix King is anything but. And simply saying, oh, he was corrupted by whatever you wish to choose as the corruption of the day, I think is weak sauce for telling that story. Yeah, the, the newer lore actually does put a lot more awesome struggle behind Calor's decision. Of yeah. like, especially if Calor was vaguely aware this was going to happen. That also makes that decision a lot more, not damning is not the right word, but a lot more of like, there is no better option I know this sucks, but like it's this or death. <laughs> and then they're also, being like, you don't understand the ramifications of what you're about to do. Yeah, totally. And um, I, I love that. Um, I don't love aspects of having to rewrite it all, but I do love that. Yeah. Is there any Ender Koresh lore in the old world? They're mentioned a, f a decent bit, um, but yeah. very, very minor. Yeah, it's like totally minor. Bits and pieces here or there. Very little to actually pin a hat on. They still hang, exist. Hang a hat on, pardon me. Don't they still exist, it. and that's very good. Like, Kingdoms yeah. of End are still a force, and the Snake Men uh, are still a thing. So, good for them. Uh, Laughing God, could the altering of the nature of magic in the old world be a sign that they might do a multiverse type situation with Age of Sigmar and uh, the old world depending on the success? No. I Listen, I know so many people don't like the end times, and mm -hmm. there's so many people that love the era of Karl Franz, and they want there to be a situation where the old world advances the timeline to the era of Karl Franz and just doesn't do the end times. And it's just, it's just not going to happen. It's just, yeah. it's just, there is no scenario where even if the old world made a billion, billion dollars, that's not going to incentivize them to retcon the end times. All that's going to incentivize them to do is write more stories about the old world, maybe mm -hmm. pop to a different period. They have mm -hmm. 15,000 years of history to work with that Lowe's. they could jump around to different stories. Like the idea that, oh, well, this means we don't need Age of Sigmar to be the sequel. No, it, that's in stone. I don't think Games Workshop will ever change that, especially since Age of Sigmar is a very profitable setting in and of itself. Yes, it um, is. And it's only... also their core setting. Let's make that very clear. They want this game to be nothing more than a prequel to what comes. They don't, you know, Age of Sigmar is the next step. It's as likely to change as 40k is as likely to no longer be tied to the Horus Heresy. Those yeah, are intrinsically incredible. linked. They, one made the other. That is it. Now, no matter how much you might look at the Horus Heresy lore and go, I really wish they hadn't just made it a whole bunch of men because these stories, for all they occasionally intrude upon them, are not necessarily the best. Um, the deep Greek tra tragedy of it all is nevertheless fucking epic and awesome. That will never be changed. That is what it is now. But when I say this, and when we take into account all of the things that happen in the old world in the end times through to Age of Sigmar, that doesn't mean that at any point they won't come in and say, you know what? 20 years later, for example, it's now time for us to do Warhammer again. And it's going to be the age of Karl Franz again. And we're going to do all of this again. And we're just going to lay out a new game in this year because we can. The chances, I think, are super low. But let's just say they do. That won't change the fact that the end times will happen. Might they repurpose the end times and make it happen in a different way? Sure, they might. And might the stories be retold in a different way? Sure. But I think the important part to understand here is it's never, ever a multiverse for all those who are reading it from the outside can't help but go. None of this works together. It's all broken. <laughs> Yeah. Every single time I read this, I'm like, you've changed it I, I, again. Like, you must be new here. <laughs> <laughs> they do this uh, yeah. a lot. <laughs> it is multiverse, if you wish to view it like that, because each game is its own separate, discrete 
entity with its own discrete identity doing its own job. They are clearly different with very different takes on how magic works, upon how the world works, upon how the factions work, as according to the needs of the game at hand and whatever it is that the writers have decided to put into that particular game. It makes it feel like, as a consumer of the information, like a massive multiverse. But as far as Games Workshop is concerned, it's not. It's all one big timeline that they can reorganize as they prefer. Yeah, and the best way I can explain it is if that to suggest that because the old world is changing things that they must be going with the multiverse theory would be like be would like be sitting next to someone who was there for the transition from third edition Warhammer Fantasy to fourth edition Warhammer Fantasy or from fourth to fifth or fifth to sixth and them being like oh they changed so much clearly this must be a multiverse theory and not a retcon of the stuff that came before nope. and that's that's just not how GW operates but I will say Blood Bowl that's in its own universe yeah that's true that's true but it's also okay but it's not a multiverse it's blood bowl yeah don't um, think of it as another version of warhammer it uses warhammer as its inspiration for many things and some people i know a couple of the designers behind the scenes have regretted that it was so tightly tied to warhammer at various points talisman tied themselves to warhammer in one of its editions the third edition in particular third edition talisman is very Warhammer-esque, but it's not part of the Warhammer world. Hero Quest was very much part of the Warhammer world. So you can again see easily, oh, that's that's just multiversal. Warhammer Quest did the same thing. No, they're all telling tales within the same world. It's not a multiverse. It's just used as according to their needs for each game. Yep. Um, Adoptus, also my favorite spell, might be Demonic Vessel. That's very chaos -y. And yeah, used by Sorcerer Lord on Dragon. Do not sink. We'll, we'll get into the lores, but um, what Andy was saying about demonology actually being very Hishian is a lot more accurate than you may realize. Mm -hmm. When you see some, a spell like Demonic Vessel, your brain may be like, oh, well, clearly this is a chaos spell. Not necessarily, because you have to remember the term demon is not as black and white as we tend to see it as. Because to us, yeah. we see the word demon and go, oh, chaos demon. There are other kinds of demons. Um, it's the wind of faith, the wind of faith. Yeah, like you have to because remember that <laughs> could be someone that is also essentially like it, it. It talks about it, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting stuff. Uh, it lore enough to make end crush DLC if they wanted to, yes, because Games Workshop would just write it. Yep, totally. <laughs> That's how it works. Yep, one hundred percent. Um, all right. So, lores battle magic is the first one <laughs> on the thing battle magic good is old battle magic um yeah I'll say it. it's the most boring it doesn't have very good theming i mean um, other than the fact that it puts a clear gnome near the bottom of the page <laughs> yeah yeah the gnome is the most exciting part yeah um, that's super fun um so battle magic is a core component of warhammer from third edition into fourth they had battle magic as a lore uh fifth i'm trying to remember that box set yeah it had battle magic and then it got dumped as they then just went into the individual lores of magic um it's been a compor a core component of warhammer through various ones and it's meant to represent any old wind of magic or any old other magic being used to hurt folk or do stuff to folk on the battlefield. And they might be any sort of tradition. So you could have Ooga Booga type shaman -y types, or we could have um, a high wizardy uh, uh, ice witches or whatever. All of them potentially using battle magic in one fashion or another. And you tend to find that Games Workshop often laps into stereotypes when they do this. Um, often to poor effect, as I noted with the Ooga Booga. Um, games workshop but <laughs> loosely speaking this is just the generic you've got a wizard on the battlefield they can cast spells and do shit lore and it is ultimately exactly as described here flavorless it doesn't have flavor other than we use it on battlefields it is one of the less well-written aspects of this book i think yeah, battle magic sucks uh, from a like a lore perspective. Like the the rules of it are great; they're fine. Yeah, they're, they're fine. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it like flavor wise, it's a boring as shit lore. They should have replaced it with like alchemy, um, which could have done a lot of similar things, but been way more interesting. Um, yeah. It 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 like overall like the spells are fine. It uses uh, spells from the lores of fire, beast, shadow, and life. Yep, uh, yep. Where you're like, oh, fireball! You throw a fireball. Uh, Curse of arrow <laughs> attraction. You know, you make arrows more accurate towards certain targets. Pillar of Flame is <sighs> pillar. It's a yeah. fire spell. Yeah. Uh, and then Oak and Shield. Oh, you get like, it's just, it's very basic, bitch. 
It really is. And uh, some of this feels also like it's a bit elementalism. Um, it's because they've added character to the spells, fireball, it feels like it's not battle magic. It should have been um, some sort of ball of energy that could have taken almost any form. There's lots of things they could have called that spell, but they've contextualized it as a single thing, which makes it feel more like elementalism than it does actual battle magic. They've sort of crossed the streams already, and that, I feel, is a little unfortunate for the theming and the understanding of what these magic types are attempting to do. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great for the rules. The rules are yeah. fine. Well, it's say, the writing behind them could have done with a tweet. Even from a rule perspective, battle magic doesn't make sense because the idea is like, oh, this is magic used in war, but so are the other five lores. Yeah, uh, I know. And it's like, now, if battle magic had been like purely offensive spells, like if they had made it where like, oh, this is a pure damage lore. So it's magic missiles, magic vortexes, and assailants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it from a rule perspective, I would have been like, okay, cool. This makes sense. Cause it's like pure offense, but it doesn't. It's like every single other lore. It's got conveyance spells, hexes, enchantments. Like it's not any more battley than the other lores. It's a stupid lore. Like it wow. doesn't make any sense. I didn't want to say this, but I, I'm going to say it anyway. When I read this bit, I was like, fuck off. That was my first actual reaction. I was going to keep that to myself because I don't like being negative. But no, I read dumb. it. It's dumb. Um, I, I read it and I literally went, fuck off. This is written without any thought as to what they're attempting to do. They have not... They have not in any way justified the spells that they've put in there. They've not in any way justified why battle magic is discrete from the other lores. All they've done is gone, oh, battle magic was a thing in a previous edition. Uh, we'll just write a battle magic section and dump some spells in it. The thought behind this is so weak that, hell, it blows over the just a... It's, it's a house of cards in terms of actually building lore upon it. It's very poorly... Um, explained and that's one of the reasons why later editions of warhammer dumped the concept of battle magic because they didn't come up with a good reason for it existing within the existing spell network and the lore network that they had already so they just dumped the concept entirely replaced it with the lores and it all kind of worked in this case battle magic needed better writing the concept's not bad this could be done i I think with these paragraphs here and the spells, the effects, if not the names, I could write a really good section for this and justify battle magic as its own thing. Something that is studied for battlefields as they are attempting to manipulate it in one fashion or another. And they just missed the mark quite a yeah, bit, if they, I think. If they had leaned into battle magic being like the actually themed lore, where it's all about just like, yeah. oh, like horrific amounts of firepower, that would have worked fine. But they didn't. Yeah. They made it generic um, and it's dumb. So we're going to throw that in the yeah. trash bin and then we're going to hop into all the fun Doesn't lores. Happen. Fuck uh, Hammer Hand and fuck off. It's a 40 key. <laughs> no, goofy, goofy ass lore. Um, yeah. So let's get into the exciting ones. So, demonology. Yeah. Yeah. So demonology. So demonology is actually worded surprisingly clever when you really stare at Like initially it looks really basic. Like when I first read through it, I was like, oh, this is the chaos lore. But then when I came back and I actually stared at it more, while it has a lot of really strong chaos themings, they do call out that there are specific non-chaos elements to it, which is fun. And this is also why when you're reading through your army books and your army lists, you can have wizards and non-chaos armies that have this lore because they're not yeah. invoking the chaos aspects of it. It's yep. very commonly used by chaos, but that's not the only form it takes, which is very good theming. Um, so... Right. It, like literally oh, no, with the old world, like I love this first sentence of when a denizen in the old world thinks of demons, they imagine nightmare servants of the chaos powers, yet the pantheon of demonic beings is far greater than this. Within the realms of chaos, there dwells an infinite number of creatures that know, owe no allegiance to the ruinous powers. That's awesome. Yep. Okay, so I have a couple of things to say. One is just a small editorial point because it really bugs me that both paragraph one and two of the color text open with almost identical sentence structures. Okay, <laughs> when a denizen of the old world thinks of demons and then, in truth, denizens of the old world think of demons rarely. Oh, fuck off. You could have written that so much better and more thematically. I see what you're attempting to do as you call out each, but that's just weak sauce. Um, that deserved a quick rewrite. I will say, though, that demonology coming into the battle game for the first time since third edition is not just essential it's it's absolutely essential warhammer world is all about 
about chaos and the summoning of things from beyond and the great horror that lies beyond our existence. To remove demonology makes no sense. They had anti-demon spells, particularly coming from the light lore, but that's because the light lore was so intrinsically tied with the concept of demonology and faith and pulling in stuff from beyond, dark gods, all that nonsense. There was a massive hole in the lore here when you're given the winds of magic as and the chaos spells as a host of rules that you have to replicate in a different setting, let's say Total to War or let's say fantasy roleplay, you are left looking at it going, so how do I summon a demon then? What do I do? <laughs> yeah. What, what do I do? How do I draw power from demons? How do I make patch with them? And you have to just write extra rules because it's completely missing this core component. When we did the fourth edition of the game, I added demonology directly back in because it was required to make sense of the world as a whole. And having it added here, when I reached this page, my previous fuck off went to, hey, I was doing my happy dance. This should be here. 100% should be here. I did find it um, amusing to see Steed of Shadow pop into that one. That made me very happy because um, that's basically a gray spell, Shadow Steed, um, popping up into what yeah, is effectively... I, I what... It's, it's a summoning. It's summoning a magical entity. And exactly on point. And it <clears> really shows the mixing of the winds that you would get with people who are demonologists rather than worrying about the individual winds. It also speaks to the weakness of the wind system and using just the eight colors of winds to replicate the things that happen in the Warhammer world and going back with the old world to what it once was, here is an absolute strength. This is where it's shining. This is where they're combining the winds and bringing about a better, more effective tale for how magic works. Battle magic was handled badly. Demonology in its conclusion, I would argue, is almost the exact opposite. Yeah, one thing I will also say, this is uh, technically it's a rules thing, but I think it represents the lore so much better is how magic works now. Yes. The fact that wizards are active participants throughout the entire, like, it's not a magic phase where you have wizards, like, going just for a couple minutes in the battle against one another, and that's it. But instead, they're constantly participating throughout the battle. And assailment spells, I fucking love. The fact that wizards are dangerous in close combat is so much better than the old stuff where they just weren't. Where, like, your goal was to try and keep your wizard in, like, the second rank or get them, like, way <laughs> off to the side or, like, do whatever shenanigans you could so they weren't in combat. In this game, the old world, which is so much better, you want your wizard in the fight because their assailment spells will wreck shop because they're fucking wizards. Like, of course, when they get into combat, they're going to go boom and just blow up, like, a whole front contingent. Like, this is so much more accurate to portraying what wizards would actually be like in battles where they have a lot of different roles they can fulfill and there are wizards that they might be a little squishy so to speak but when but they're going to cast and unleash horrific amounts of damage in in combat scenarios because hmm. they're not so, powerless I'm also going to add a small note about the spells as well and that's that here we've almost got it sorted in a fashion that allows it to be a generic set of spells that could be flavored differently, but they screw up in a couple of places, and I'm going to call it out. The summoning is perfect. You're summoning something. Great. You couldn't ask for a better spell. Now, does um, you've got then Steed of Shadows, not perfect. Shouldn't have been Shadows. It should have been Steed of something that didn't tie it to just the Grey Wind. It should have been something that spoke to the possibility of what would come with the Grey Wind later without it yeah, being that. To me, it, that smacks of them being like, hey, remember this spell? You remember yeah, this spell, guys, okay. from 8th edition? Here's, um, here's that famous spell. Um, uh, Gathering Darkness? Fine. Demonic Familiars? I would rather Demonology wasn't necessarily tied to only demons. So having Familiars is perfect. Demonic Familiars is perhaps too chaos, but not necessarily bad. Because you've got to remember in the warmer world you have spirits of all types as well, and Demonology as a type can contact spirits. Demonic Vessel? Again, Demon is perhaps strong, but I'll live with it. Vortex of Chaos? I'd have preferred not Chaos. Vortex of something would have been better, but Vortex I'll live with, um, and Demonic Vigor. So the only one that I really have any particular issue with is Steed of Shadows. I will also call out the fact that they called three of them Demonic. Yeah, it, that well, it, weak like, sauce yeah, writing. They're like demo demonology. Hey guys, it's demonology. So demonic demon, vessel, demonic demon, failures, demonic vigor. Demon. No, you, 
You be more imaginative. Get a thesaurus. There's, lot, there's <laughs> lots of words you can use instead. So I love the toning here where you're not calling out it being one thing in particular. This isn't like the previous one where you've got fireball, which says immediately it's fire. It's actually the only one that does the same thing here broadly is Steed of Shadows, which I think could have done. Yeah, I would have reading. loved so much if they'd stuck with the theming of the signature spell of the summoning. Where like mm -hmm. instead of demonic or demonic vessel, if it was like the pact, and then yeah, the figure was like the some other word that's similar. That completely would have been a much agree. Stronger theming. Um, and all it would have taken from the writing of it as well to say, you know, demonologist and the different forms that they can take. So it's not just necessarily making pats with chaos and demons and all the rest. It's controlling them and using spirits from beyond in ways that they do not like. So you're actually manipulating the things that lie beyond to your own ends. And that would have been beautiful. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit too demon focused in terms of the writing i think but yeah i guess i still I, I i will go back to my original comment i freaking love this shit should have been in warhammer all along yeah um i think we should probably super chat in between before we go yeah, to our next sure. one um it's super easy to forget those little bad boys gary reynolds thank you my uh gary really hey gary you thank you uh, really nice to see you out there as well if you're watching this later and i'll do it hey gary you rock hope your trip to the bathroom was uh fruitful uh, <laughs> Necromancer Cobalt. Preferably with less fruit. Temple Talk question. How is Necromancy as far as having a player use it? If it isn't obvious by my name, it's my favorite type of magic. We'll get to Necromancy. We're, We're not there Necromancy. yet. Necromancy. We'll We're there. almost there. Yeah, yeah, We're almost totally. there. Uh, it's the it's coming up. It's coming up quick. But uh, yeah, the answer is, is it's actually way better than it used to be, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I we'll get into that. Too. All right, dark magic. So this is your chaos lore, functionally. Um, yeah. They, uh, this lore. Uh, interestingly, none of the l spell names are original. They're all taken from 8th edition lores, uh, yeah. where Doombolt and Word of Pain are from actual dark magic from the Dark Elf book. Stream of Corruption is a Nurgle spell. Infernal Gateway is Zinch spell. Phantasmagoria is a Slanesh spell. Battlelust, I think, is actually a newly named one. And then Soul Eater was also from the Dark Elf lore. Yeah. Um, so it, they what they basically did is they took dark magic and the chaos lores and they kind of mixed them together and were like okay here's your new dark magic though i will note they do not explicitly call out the dark gods in the three dark god spells they'll seem more like easter eggs as opposed to because they could have been like oh it's the stream of corruption is the power of nurgle being vomited from your mouth but they don't say that which i'm glad they say no the wizard literally throws out his hands and a stream of dark magic tears the flesh off the people in front of him cool um so it there are some fun call outs but i'm glad they didn't lean into it of being like oh look it's dark god magic it's just dark magic so i am going to take a slightly different line because <laughs> because i think sotex line is correct but i think thematically they made a poor choice and the reason I think this is because it makes chaos magic not unique. It makes chaos magic just part of a bigger whole of stuff rather than being tied to the individual gods and the gifts they provide or whatever. It takes away some of the theme of chaos. Dark magic is something quite different to chaos magic in the lore as we understand it. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to change it, but I do feel that here they have weakened chaos by just making it dark magic and they've weakened dark magic by just ad adding it as an aspect of chaos. And that for me is not necessary. There are so many dark magic spells across the various editions. You could easily have taken any of them and come out with very similar mechanical ones. Now, whilst I sort of like the nod to the Chaos Gods, and also sort of like the uh, suggestion that the Chaos Gods are responsible for the whole concept of dark magic in the first place, I kind of get that. But in many respects, it makes the Dark Elves look so, like fucking idiots. What I will say to counter that is that what they did for the Lords of Chaos, which I think they... So they they did a weird thing here where they're like they're kind of like ah about these old spells because there we do have our actual lore of chaos but it's yep, considered yep. one of the specialty lores in the uh the in the ravening hordes book the because Dirk. all of the all for those unaware all of the factions have their own lore of magic 
every single fa- every single faction that has magic has their own lore. Um, mm-hmm. But they basically changed it where instead of you getting a whole lore, you get one, you get like a small handful of spells. Yeah. Um, so like in the lore of chaos, you get an undivided spell, a zinc spell, a Nurgle spell, and a Slash spell. That's it. Um, until you get, until we get more books later, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but so like I, I do like that dark magic is accessible to a lot more factions where it's like, oh, this is. I dark. like that also. Yeah. Um, I do. I do think that the way they describe what dark magic is, they lean a little heavy into the chaos, but I don't think it's too bad. Nope. Neither um, do I. In fact, I, I, I don't have any issue with any of that. The only issue I have is um, adding chaos spells to dark magic. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah, everything else seems fine to me. Adding any spell that is a chaos spell to dark magic weakens both the theme of dark magic and chaos. Yeah, it, the, yeah, and the thing the thing that's just strange about it is like if you didn't know these spells are from the old chaos books, there's nothing in here that implies that they're yeah, chaos. totally. Um, it's it's totally fine on face value, but yeah. for those of us who see who know the greater lore, you're just left going, oh, that's just demon corrupt. What? Okay, that's yeah, it. What? Um, a... And you can't separate that from Nurgle, no matter how you try, because it's a Nurgle spell and has been since third edition Warhammer, has been since first edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. It's a Nurgle spell, and to put a Nurgle spell into what is effectively your Dar lore is, to me, an extreme mistake. Yeah, it, it, it feels like an Easter egg gone a little sour, is the yeah. best way I can describe it. Yeah, uh, I do um, like that means more. we can't have stream of corruption for Nurgle now. Yeah, yeah, that is the weird thing. That means you can't do that anymore. The core spell for Nurgle is no longer in a Nurgle list. And for me, that's just an in, it's almost an egregious error. Because if I've got myself a, a big huge Nurgle chappy sitting on a palanquin of Nurgle, being carried by Nurglings or whatever else, I love the idea of a mighty stream of corruption coming out, maggot-filled, pus pile horror as it's Stinks up um, the whole shop, and yes, I can still yeah. do that sort of, but it's just not Nurgle I would, anymore. Yeah, I, w- I would have definitely preferred that instead of flesh. I mean, they gave Nurgle fleshy abundance, which is another famous one, but stream of corruption, I would have preferred. Yeah, it's it's almost um, the um, ultimate one because it's been there since the beginning. Yeah, fleshy abundance sounds like it can be Slanesh. Uh, the 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 tone is different. Yeah, yeah. Um, but overall, I like yeah, the lore. It's fine. Um, yeah, me, me too. Um, uh, I am hyper picking here, but I think that's part of the point of our streams, is it not? To occasionally dive in and going, really, that's the choice you made on this tiny little snippet of four words. <laughs> yeah. Uh, elementalism. This is a very, very fun lore of magic. Um, this is a a great one as it talks about it talks about all sorts of different things from like elemental spirits, kind of implying like spites or dryads or naiads and stuff like that. Uh, as well as talking about, uh, you know, you kind of have your hedge witches sort of implied here. I love that they talk about like blacksmiths uh, using elementalism to try and like affect their forges. Um, and there's a lot of really like the w- I do like that for some of the lores. They don't do this for all the lores, but like for elementalism, I love that they talk about the more casual uses of how this magic would be used secretly. Yep, um, agreed. Within society. That's a mm-hmm. cool call out. That was not yeah. necessary, but I like it a lot. Uh, more of that would have been uh, really welcome, I think, because there's certain aspects of the previous descriptions which weren't really doing much for world building or indeed description of the wind at hand, where this dials into some of the detail. I absolutely love that they're including something like this. I don't love some of the choices for the spells that they put in. And again, not for the mechanical reasons for the spells. The lore itself is kind of fucking awesome. Um, my issues more lie in with having ones like Summon Elemental Spirit, which is beautiful. It can be almost any aspected spirit. It's brilliant. And then Earthen Ramparts. That could <laughs> that could have been any sort of rampart flaming sword well i can't have a giant watery sword i'm an elementalist surely if i want to theme one of my elementalists to say for example be one that's entirely water-based now i can't if i want to do flaming sword that doesn't make sense according to the type of 
character that I'm imagining in place. And they discuss them being elementalists <laughs> largely of different types, but here they are all types wrapped up with poor descriptions. Yeah, once spells. again, suffering, I would say suffering from Easter eggs, where it's like, yeah. the sword, they're going, oh, remember? Remember Flaming, flaming Sword? Flaming Sword of Ruin? Yeah, Flaming mm. Sword of Ruin. Remember Plague of Rust, guys? Remember Plague yeah. of Rust? Even though Plague of Rust is really weird in this lore, to be honest. It really uh, is a bit of an odd choice, but uh, it, sure. Yeah. But like a lot, like summon elemental spirit is a genuinely new spell. That's a lot of fun, really cool. Uh, yeah. But like a lot of these other ones are like clearly referencing specific spells uh, from like older stuff, which is just they didn't have to go so heavy on the references. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Um. And I think that's um ultimately the issue I have with the spells in general. So I don't just repeat this as we move into other ones. And that's that the lores are general, but the spells are too specific. And they would have been better giving them broader names, um, much as they did with Summon Elemental Spirit, which is really cool. Yeah, it's exactly what they should have for done. Demonology. Great. Yeah, exactly. Super cool. Um, they work really well, but the, the, the moment they go specific, they start ruining the themes of individual armies that might be created using these things. Because you might have yourself a big fiery pyromancer type idea for your one, and you're like, okay, I'll now do a Earthen Rampart. Right. I'll do a wind blast rather than a searing hot blast of whatever it is that you want to be throwing in that direction. It is a bit unfortunate. But traveling Mystic Pathway, nice and bland and broad yeah. and useful. Nah. So yeah, um, well, we catch our uh, we got another couple of super chats in between. How would a Cathayan demonologist work with they summon a demonic aspect of a dragon? Also, would how would the shattering of magic affect Cathay? So, okay, the first thing is that would it be a demonic aspect of a dragon? No, they probably it'd probably be based on the entity they're talking to. Mm -hmm. Um, so it would be like who knows what it could be. It could maybe be an entity that appears like a spirit that maybe their people knew before the dragons took control of them, or it's a spirit of the land. Or it's like a like a spirit that takes a particular animal form uh, based on an animal that they've seen, or it takes the form of a particular nightmare or a particular idea they have. Like demons and spirits, their the limitations to their forms are basically imagination and the fabric of reality pressing down on them, and that's about it. Which is a pretty broad fucking spectrum. Uh, it could yeah. be like an ancestor spirit type mm -hmm. entity as well. Um, so, uh, but as far as the shattering of magic, how could that affect Cathay? That's a great question that really I would have is. loved to have seen addressed. And they just kind yeah. of don't. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm going to call this out. The shattering of magic and its effect on Cathay, as it currently stands, doesn't make a great deal of sense with all the lore that we have for dragons, both the Western and Eastern kinds that are presented. So the answer to that is we're not sure yet because it really needs to be tackled because they have changed things. Again, I know this sounds deep, but really fundamentally when it comes to what happened with magic. So fundamentally, I would argue that certain stories are going to have to be rewritten or what's been written inside this book is going to be rewritten again as they move into various backgrounds for various factions. Yep. And then uh, Necromancer, I'm sorry when I said Necromancer on tabletop, I meant, the, oh, the role play game. Um, Oh, interesting. Uh, how can this necromancy, as far as having a player use it in your tabletop game, not easy, but it's totally doable? Yeah. Um, indeed, uh, I would suggest uh, for those who've been following the Lawhammer streams, um, there's a character in there who literally last episode pretty much gave one expression of how that could manifest. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I do think that there is a far broader application of how things could turn out here. Yeah, and the best way is like someone that is either a necromancer but hiding that they can use magic at all, or is a ne is gone into necromancy but is hiding their identity, pretending to just be a simple wizard of the colleges. Those happen a lot, especially you have to remember the the biggest tragedy of necromancy is that the vast majority, like ninety to ninety five percent of the people that turn to necromancy, don't do it for power. It's often driven by tragedy, of them trying to bring back a loved one or trying to preserve the life of someone that's incredibly ill with a sickness that can't be cured or trying to find a secret for like a lost lineage or get the last words to a loved one. They never got to say like, there's a lot of great storytelling behind the people who become necromancers, but the twisted, the twisted nature of Nagash's form of necromancy, which is something we're going to touch on in a minute. Um, 
causes people to be corrupted by the influence of messing with that power. But there's a lot of really fun stories to be told there, especially with the player character, of trying to hide the fact they can use necromancy and not and genuinely not trying to use it for nefarious means. But if they keep tapping into that well of power, it's going to start to affect them, which role-playing wise could be super fun to play out. Right. Okay. Yeah, agreed. All right. Hi, Magic. Um, okay. So this one, uh, it's it's it basically kind of repeats everything they talked about before, where they're like there used to be. I do find it interesting the way they described magic in the world of that uh, magic used to be seen as a bunch of gentle clouds of silvery light, but then after vortex after chaos showed up, became gusting gales and swirling storms that then after the creation of the vortex uh shattered into the kaleidoscope winds of magic which is an interesting series of ways to put it okay right i hate this one <laughs> okay now there's a reason i hate this one it's because this one says high magic is high elf magic that's what it says Two of its spells are directly high elf spells. Shield of Safri, Fury of Cain. It's all about the freaking elves. They're not the only ones that use high magic. There's a lore change in that they very clearly state that no longer is it a coruscating energy. It's silver. Um, beforehand, high magic was often described as coruscating, glittering, sparkling with all colors, the potential of all eight winds wrapped up into one thing. It, the word coruscating was quite common. Um, when you're de detailing high magic. Now it's silvery and argent and similar. Um, so we have a slightly different version. But to simply call out that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, it's like, okay, so they're like, I oh, a high it. mage. It's like, A, <laughs> this is this the Lord. core book. This yeah. is the core book. And this means that they are saying, yeah, we're never going to use Slan. They're, that's a lie. No matter what their plans are, they might. They might, and this book doesn't allow for something making sense that they might do. Remember when I said I wouldn't mention doing specific spells? I lied. I hate this. I actually hate that they tie it to the high elves. Now, the nature of the spells and all the rest, sure. The description that they use for high magic really feels like they have no idea what high magic is. Because they're just stressing saying things like, you know that other magic? You might think that high magic is just like that other magic, but it's not because it's silver. Yeah, and, um, what's, what's and it's is... really poorly expressed. They have no idea what they're doing with their high magic here. You might think it's just like dark magic or any of the other lesser Norse, but it's not. It's better. They, they they don't. They're doing too much tell, not show. They're not explaining what high magic is almost at all, other than saying there was this and it became this, and now it's this, but it's still there and it's silver and stuff. Yeah. I really dislike this entire section. It feels like it was written by someone who wasn't <laughs> sure what they wanted it to be. So yeah. thus, well, it and, was written yeah, poorly. And we've been through this before, where in when in, when they gave the Slon access to high magic originally, I think seventh edition, they had the same problem of there were elf spells in high magic, and then in eighth edition, I think it was like, like before seventh edition, wasn't it? All the way back in the very <clears> first Muslim <throat> army uh noon well First maybe trip. in fifth maybe with the battle cards but six you could not use high magic you only could use the battle lores um but in, but, that. but, but in seventh edition they were like oh we want the salon to use high magic again but they had weird elf spells so in eighth edition they fixed it where in eighth edition they changed the names of all the spells to be neutral so that they weren't elf themed and, and the original high the and the original high magic spells weren't really that anyway, <laughs> but which, which is what particularly bugs me. They had access to all of this lore. They have so many high elf spells and slan spells and just high spells because this is restricting. It's saying that the only ones that they really want to have high magic are elves, and that is an absolute nonsense. The Warhammer world is far broader and bigger. It cuts it off from them saying, you know what? This end thing that I've created, they yeah, have figured out how to use all eight winds of magic together and create this coruscating energy of high. They know how to use high magic. No longer does that make any sense because then they'll be casting Fury of Cain. This is 
a nonsense. This is theme to high elves and is, I feel, an absolute mess. Now, that's pretty strong, but I feel quite strongly about how magic is expressed in general. <clears throat> I think some aspects of this are brilliant. I think other aspects of this had so little thought put behind it that they just slapped it down on the page and went, that'll do, Gov, and moved on to the next bit. Someone came along as an editor and went, yeah, that looks all about right. But nobody just sat down and said, what are we doing with this? Yeah, What's it's... the stories we're telling? And the story that they're telling here is elves. And it's so silly because the, the page that's describing what high magic is does a good job. Like, it doesn't mention elves anywhere. It just talks about what high magic is. It even talks about how spells that would be used by other types of wizards when used by high magic wizards, which they refer to as high mages because high magic, high mage, um, would be how they would be different. Where, like Andy said, they use the term incandescently. When talking about if a high mage were to cast fireball or a similar equivalent, it would appear very, very different. Um, and it would function different and probably be more powerful, um, which is great. Like all the words. I, I don't cool. think that's great at all. I disagree. I think the wording here is weak um, because they have no concept of what they want high magic to be other than it's like other magic, but better. Yeah, that's fair. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not got any description as to what high magic is. What it's got is basically a, a description as to what it is in comparison to something else. You might think it's this, but it's actually better. It just feels like elf propaganda again, much as we had similarly <laughs> earlier, um, where it's just, I feel, not as well conceived as it could be. I absolutely love the idea that it's been included. I love the idea that they've got the lore there. I think the implementation of it is so poorly considered and conceived that it's almost completely eradicated as a useful wind, or not wind, but a useful magic for more than one faction. This is elf magic. Why are elves getting so much attention in what is a very small magic section? It's almost mm. unfair. It's almost unfair that they get a lore to themselves. Well, and it, it just it smacks as weird because the second they introduce Grand Cathay, the Grand Cathay is gonna have access to high magic. Like the Shuki yeah. can use it. Like they're gonna they're gonna have signature spells from the lords of yin and yang, but they're going to have high magic as one of the options. Um which yeah, like, the second yeah. they do that, then they've got to rewrite this, which is just dumb. Yeah, it is because this is the core book, and sadly, the core book has not really considered what comes next at all. Um, anyway, let's grab our uh, super chats on the way in between because I'll just whine about this for ages. Because high magic, Bob, <laughs> high magic is Rastafarian magic, blombo clat. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, you carry on. How does spell name work? When would Tanwin cast a transformation mm -hmm. of Kaden, then ask himself who's Kaden? No, not in the general. So the so mm, that is a great question to ask, which is why the spells that they introduce are often really bad because they are a very specific one perspective on how that spell would work. If you were dealing with the Lizardman, Dehenuin would not cast Transformation of Caden. He would cast a spell that is similar, and the overall product of what he's casting is very is not identical, but it's similar enough. But the problem yeah. when you say transformation of Caden is you imply that every beast wizard in the world is studying from the same lexicon and knows who the fuck Caden is, when the yeah, only so, people that actually know that would be Gurite shamans. I'll take well, that back further. Transformation of Caden used to be a dark magic spell. Um, and we had exactly the same commentary when we were discussing it all the way back. And you had your dark with dark elf turning into a manticore and going, do they really know who the fuck Kadon is in the first place? This makes absolutely no sense. And it doesn't. The spells were often written <sighs> purely from the perspective of the empire and the various histories that led into the empire. So that if you had a dark wizard from the empire, it totally made sense because they were using a spell that they would have learned from a previous iteration that came into that place. And that is my issue with the spell namings here as well. They could have used more... And I, I hate the word generic. It's not generic. What it is is names that could apply to multiple situations. So that means they can be, for example, the transformation of Caden to one person, but it could be the transformation of, I don't know, to anyone or whatever you want to say, to another wizard. It, what you need to do is ensure that the spell names that you're using both have flavor, but can be used in multiple instances. And spells like that simply don't make sense. Easy to fix, though. Super easy. Yeah, 
What did Budo when he say say when he saw how <laughs> end was represented Warhammer? It's nonsense. Hmm. <laughs> I'm a child. That amused me. Right. Um, <laughs> We're running long time, so let's knock out these last few lords real quick. I'm, uh, I'm actually going to drop out that just little comment and say I agree. Universal language makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. Nice one. Uh, all right. Illusion magic. Uh, this one, it's, it's basically just <laughs> shadow magic with a couple of bonuses thrown in. Yeah. Um, this, um, this actually is the lore that shows the issue with their choices because this is gray magic with knobs on, basically. This is gray <laughs> magic with extra bits. Um, and, there is, and that there is, is what they should all be. It yeah. should be gold magic with extra bits, your alchemy. Blue magic with extra bits, perhaps your fate witch or some equivalent. Um, elementalists are basically jade or wear it that's what these should all be and this one is a perfect example of that and it all makes sense and even the illusion names things like columns of crystals shimmering dragons glittering robes mind raiser mind raiser interesting choice confounding and all the rest of it yeah that all makes sense all the names are suitably generic they're not translated down into a single name or one species or anything else so this and is whilst, a good one yeah so whilst the writing of the illusionist section is not necessarily the best the overall conclusion on this one is They've nailed it, and this is how they should have nailed all of them. Yeah, I I like this lore. Uh, yeah. I like that they I like the way they describe illusionism as far as like, especially at the last bit where it talks about that it's a dangerous lore because a the people that use it are incredibly dangerous, but b that they can they can get drawn into their own illusions. That's a cool bit of world building. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the idea of wizards being tricked by their own magic and getting trapped in yep. illusions of their own designs. That's great. great. Yeah, um, love it. But yeah, there, there's lots lore. of good here. Great. It, yeah, the vast majority of it is very, very heavily shadow. But you have things like glittering robe is a classic spell from Lord yeah. of Metal, but Lord it, Metal. but fits perfectly within this concept. Absolutely um, agreed. I, I might not have made it the signature spell, um, because it's so heavily uh, attached to gold. But I, I'd have probably given a similar outcome with a slightly different name. Um, but yeah, it's fine. <laughs> no necromancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> necromancy uh, all right so necromancy is interesting yeah. <laughs> of, um they they talk specifically about it being the wind of death and the wind of shadow melding with the wind of life and the amber wind of beasts this is the only lore where they kind of go out of their way to call out what lores kind of comprise it which is very interesting it's a, it's 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 certainly an interesting one. It's almost like they're trying to justify a thing. Um, they could easily <laughs> they could easily have just effectively made this the purple wind plus one. It would have mm. fit in perfect. There was no need to overcomplicate it in your desperate desire to try and ground it into the world building as you perceive it. This could have been the perfect purple wind plus wind this could have been the perfect manifestation of the distillation of everything the gash did back in the past through multiple hands as it's gone down through generation after generation after generation the purple wind which is a real thing according to this setup okay being far stronger being influenced in different ways broadly speaking i don't dislike most of this although seeing spectral steed pop up again is an interesting one um yeah, no, did they so, really need to do it twice yeah. um what i will mm, say for this lore is that uh um, dwellers below really yeah, it what's what's interesting about this lore is that it is not calling it necromancy is can be a little misleading because they're not necromancers in the sense that you would think. Mm -hmm. You if you hear a necromancer, your brain's gonna go, oh, vampire count necromancer. That's not what these guys are. These are people that communicate with the dead, yes, and are able to manipulate forces of death to harm people. Um, Perfect. but they are not they're not raising corpses and shambling yeah. legions. And I love this. Um, I really like that they took a slightly different view um, and they took a more broader view of what necromancy could and would be. And then they can go specific for each of the individual factions as they go, well, yeah, these ones are all dealing with moving undead forces or these ones here are all dealing with vampiric stuff or whatever they decide to eventually do. This, I think, is really nice. It's relatively broad. They haven't tied it to any individual names. So you don't have Van Hell's dance, which never makes any real sense. You know, this sense. one is wonderful. Okay. It's, generic. it's wonderfully it's generic, universal is the language we've chosen. Sorry, apparently. yes, universal. Yeah, yeah. Universal, love that one. Um, uh, I actually think they've done a really good job of simultaneously massively attacking what everybody thinks is necromancy in Warhammer, but in a good way. This is another one that I think rocks. 
I don't the bit I don't like is saying that uh, all those wins they could have just made this purple win plus that would have done. Um, I again think this one broadly nails it. Yeah, I also will say uh, though I don't think it doesn't fit. Um, uh, it's just changed dramatically from what it used to be. Dwellers below going from being the ultimate <laughs> life spell to the signature death spell is very funny to me. And you know, originally uh, that, that's it's moved around good old dwellers below more than once. Um, and uh, I don't like that. Now, I, the reason I don't like it is because they purposely chose to do that, and it's almost like they're going, narny, 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 narny. Now, it might make more sense to go here, and that's really cool, but they could have just made it a new spell. Yeah, I will say, I always found Dwellers of the World to be kind of a weird Gyran spell. Uh, I think yeah, it fits totally here better. Is. Um, um, it's Gyran, yeah. it was a weird spell. Um, wow. You use, and then, wow, the last lore. Um it is very strange to me this lore got put in the core book. Uh, granted, granted, if they end up doing what we all hope they're going to do, and they're like, oh, we're going to do hobgoblins, and we're going to do these other green skin races, then okay, yeah, sure, having a core wall magic, fine, because then it's going to be in multiple books. Um, for right now, it feels a little weird, uh, especially because it's it's just the lore of Gork and Mork slapped together. Um, yeah, I um, I like that we've got wa magic i like that they have spent time to explain that wa magic is different even though in actual practice it's not really um i like that we have ourselves um a section dedicated to it this is all good what i don't like is mixing gork and mork now yeah. mixing gork and mork may make sense in the long term gork and morka whatever but mixing gork and mork here feels like Gork or Mork have no character, that they're no different. Yeah, and, and this is, I think this is another thing of the suffering, because it's like they're separate in here. In yeah. Ravening Hordes, they're two very distinct lores. Yeah. Um, whereas Absolutely. In, yeah, and this, here. I will say, I do find it funny when, like, I actually don't hate it when they do the Fist of Gork, or maybe Mork, or Hand of Mork, or Gork, or Foot of Gork, or Mork. Like, I do find that cute where it's like, it's not exactly clear which one it is, so it kind of allows both to have access. Um, but at the same time, I, I think having it be a little more generic is... I, I actively dislike it. It's, um, it's I'll, just I'll go, weird. It's yeah, just um, weird. It, it feels like they're trying to be cute, and they're trying to write a thing that they think may be vaguely amusing, or, or they're just desperate to try and make it work for both in a fashion they could have done differently. I don't like that they basically say they're identical. That's yeah, what I, this says. This doesn't say they're different. Well, yeah, this and it reinforces adds, it adds that confusion because then this says, yeah. no, they're separate. And it's yeah, like, completely. well, which is it? <laughs> which is it? Um, and this is classic thematic undermining. This is where an editor should come in, whoever's controlling the line, and say, you can't do that. You've basically made Mork and Gork the same. How dare you make them the same? That's just utterly unacceptable for the greenskins. They may become Gorka Morka or whatever you are going to move towards, but this this is not good. This is yeah, bad. To me, to me, this smacks of a rules person who came in and said, okay, we're going to have the lores of magic in the core book, but none of the army books are allowed to have magic lores. They only get signature spells, so make it work. And the greenskin guys were like, well... We need to have a lore for the greenskins. They can't only have signature spells. So I particularly we want it, well, it's but, on Gork. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's a very weird set of why, decisions. I, I don't why, think it should be in the core book. I think it should just be in the like Yeah. I think that would have made it better. I'm slapping them separately. But you know, having three instances of Gork supersede Mork is also unacceptable. You've got Fist of Gork or Mork. You've got Foot of Gork or Mork. And then you've got the hand of Mork or Gork, so that's two to one. And then in the actual text, blessed by Gork or possibly Mork. Gork coming first three times out of four. There's not even balance here. So not only have they in, uh, basically mixed the two of them up and said they're basically the same, they have also balanced it heavily to Gork, saying that Gork should come first. It's almost like they're desperate for Gork and Morka to be a thing. And it's just weird. I don't like it. I think that this could be significantly better written and had identical rules. Uh, yeah. This is uh, it, great, it's, but yeah, it's it's no. just an odd series of choices. Um, like I, it is. 
I really don't like the idea that they're trying to force all of the lords of magic into the core book and then be like, okay, all the individual armies only get signature spells. There's a time where that'll work, and there's times where that won't work. Yeah. Um, if you want that to work, you need 10 lures in the book at least. Yeah. So it's just it's just very strange to me. Um, yeah. Where it's it, really strange. I mean, if we got ourselves like, a high elf wizard who can do, say, four winds of magic, how? Yeah. It, it, it smacks of it smacks of there's certain individuals that were involved in the creation of this book trying to force ideas that just don't fit, but they're like, fuck you. It's a square hole. Make it work. And it, yeah. and, it, and it fucks up when they do that. Like, I hate when they do that shit because it's dumb. Yeah. Uh, agreed. I'm going to bring up cool point there. Do you think they should use the different term like spiritualism or thanatology instead of necromancy? No, I'm quite no, happy with I, it. I think the, the word yeah. necromancy is appropriate. It's completely spot on and is correct. It's how it would be used in game world. It's how it would be used uh, in general. The individual types of necromancy, as the books in the gash might pop them down, will give you perhaps access to a variety of fun and very different type of spells. But I am 100% cool with that. Yeah, I think the, the, the thing to do would not be to say, oh, this isn't necromancy. It would be to say, now let's explore why ne Nagash's necromancy is so distinct. Yeah, absolutely. And why vampirism and how it expresses its version, they all have access to a similar pool of basic spells. That, to me, makes a lot of sense. I really yeah, like, like that. I, 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 they did a good job. Necromancy was an appropriate time to do this because when you yeah. get into the Tomb Kings in the Ravening Hordes book, they explain why the lore of Nehekara is different uh, and what makes it unique. And that is good and fun theming and gives you access to your actual like resurrection spells, mm -hmm. which is great. Uh, the Lord of Mankind. So that, that's a good way of doing what they did here. Yeah. Um, so if, if I was to sum up this <clears throat> section in general, I would say that there is a really good idea here. And the idea is that we have ourselves a bunch of lores that are sort of based upon the Winds of Magic, but aren't, and are used by all of the different factions. That is great. But what they gave us instead was some super specific lores that won't be used by all of the factions, meaning that the core rulebook is almost certainly only going to be useful in certain places. And they're going to have to add extra lores later anyway. I still think that if they just taken what they did with illusionism, with necromancy, with demonology, those three, and added another five for the other obvious winds of magic alternatives, they would have had a really strong core for not only representing the eight winds of magic, if you wish, plus signature spells for those who mastered those winds in different ways. You've also got a way of showing how the various wizards and witches and sorcerers and mages out there don't really do proper core wind of magic stuff and have some weird oddities and they create dar or whatever else on top of that you could add the unique stuff like wah or you could add the stuff like the skaven magic or the high magic or dark magic in its purest form or chaos magic if you must you could add all those on but they're not really needed except for those specific factions so you could easily just have a single page dedicated to the lore that that specific faction requires given that they clearly intend high magic to only be high elves up to that point they could have just added a high lore that's especially designed for high elves in that book they didn't instead they crunched it down into a selection of lores that was representative of an old system from third edition or first edition Warhammer Fantasy roleplay and doesn't fit what we have for the modern world. It's a great basis, though. I think if they'd just gone further, they would have had, I think, arguably one of the best spell setups for the old world they could have had. I don't think they went far enough. They should have pushed the boat a bit further. And what we have is a sort of half-half mishmash of things that sort of work, they sort of don't work. They don't make a great deal of sense in the lore, but do work fine for game balance. I'm no real worry on that side. For the game, sure. But for making sense of the world, I think they've not just made errors. They've made multiple relatively deep and big errors. Yeah, I think Ooh. the biggest, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing would have, would have been to say that if they do a second edition, which I think they will, it would be really nice to... it. They shot themselves in the foot by trying to force themselves to make every single faction's lore without really seeming to have a good idea of where they're going in the future in yeah. the core book. They mm. would it, hopefully maybe going the second or third edition, they'd make their lives so much easier if they just did eight core lores that are like messy versions, like fun yeah. messy versions of the of each of the battle lores. Maybe do a ninth lore for dark magic 
um, and a 10th lore for like chaos magic. And that gives you like your core 10 set. And then, and then like, there are certain factions that you can have just the, Oh, they have like one or two signature spells and that's fine. But like for the high elves, just give instead of it. Cause like the green skins get a page for their magic. Just like man, Doctor says here, yeah. so they have six spells. They have three for Mork, three for Gork. All they had to do was use two pages instead of one and have one page be the lore of Mork and one page be the lore of Gork. You're done. Um, and it would it would be so much easier and so much less. I, they're just putting rules in weird places because they're trying to like force this to fit a certain method instead of doing what would be the more smooth solution. And it's yeah. weird to see. Yeah, I I I actively dislike it. But I actively like many aspects of it, <laughs> you know, to get there. Also good. I like yeah, it. yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I find myself in this strange half half position where I both actually really like much of what they've done, but think that the implementation, particularly with the writing, has got a great deal to be desired. Hey, Bearded Fickle! Happy, happy birthday, birthday. Happy birthday Bearded yeah, Fickle! Happy birthday to you, good sir, and thank you very much for the... the thank season. you very much. That's an odd back front birthday gift, but happy birthday nonetheless. <laughs> Super nice. I'm really glad that it's all going over there. I love when people give me money for their birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> That's very Warhammer, though, because in the Warhammer world, if you didn't know, on your birthday, you give gifts to other people, at least in the Empire. It's a very shallion thing to do because you are being thankful for the mercy of your continued life. And her dad more coming along and not, you know, chopping your head off with that. <laughs> but we're done. Are we done the book? It took us three streams. So that's by almost 10 hours. <laughs> yeah, that that's really sad. <laughs> when you put it that way. Uh, yeah, we it, took us, it took us, yeah, about 10 hours. Uh, wow. But we have finally made it through all the lore of the core book. Holy crap. Um, uh, so uh do you have a summation you think for all of the lore in the book and how you would uh sum it up yeah. in, let's say a relatively pithy way what what i would say is that overall the old world is trying to approach a very difficult concept of coalescing everything that came before it and trying to improve on it which is a super fucking difficult task and an admirable um, goal yeah, and I'm very here for it. And I want to make it clear that even though I and we criticized a lot of elements of it, I if I didn't like it and I was not enjoying it, I would not be nearly as critical because I just wouldn't care. The problem is I like a lot of it. So the parts of it that stick out are I'm like, like, you know, it, it's when I'm walking a path that I'm enjoying treading that that nail sticking up that I hit my foot on is much more irritating than if the path was just a fucking mess because then I just wouldn't go that way. Yeah. Um, I will say that the old world to me very much smacks of a book that seems to have had different people's hands on it who had very different visions mm. um, to which almost seems to imply that there may have been some disagreements between studios, if not, between writers but it feels like between studios and i hope that they can get their shit together and get those things resolved because it's painfully obvious when they're not on the same page yeah. and it hurts it hurts the setting um i don't know why but there's something going on there um i'm excited for the old world i feel like games workshop was a little too conservative with its opening um, but to be fair to them, they also had zero idea how well it was going to perform. Yep. Um, and I'm excited for the future. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have almost the same summation um, in that I find this to be a deeply ambitious book, which is attempting to consolidate many ideas that few have attempted to consolidate before. And when it's in full swing, it does that exceedingly well. If, for example, it's looking at the formation of the Warhammer world and where it came from, from the old ones passing through, it does a very good job of re-examining those old tales and spinning them in a way that brings all of the different factions together. But this is also its weakest point because it has an absolute lack of ambition when it comes to continuing that and explaining all of the factions that we are we all know are present in the Warhammer world. It spends an enormous amount of time discussing Slan and Lizardmen without any intent 
of going in that direction. So we have wasted pages. And I think that that speaks to an overall lack of clarity of vision for what this set should be. Is it just the old world? And if it is, approximately half the lore that we were discussing is irrelevant. Completely mm. unneeded. They could have used those pages to build a bigger, better story for the world that they were presenting. Is it Warhammer Revisited? And if that's the case, then all of that lore is not only essential, it's core, but they just don't finish it off. They don't describe all the rest, meaning that we're left going, well, this is a bit patchy. There's some bits, but there's not other bits. They've detailed this. They've spent a long time talking about things that are never going to be relevant. They've got a whole bunch of very pointed comments about Pirates of Sartosa, for example. But they've also got tons about Skaven. Like Skaven, and they've got this, and they've got... There's so much patchiness as to which parts of the lore they're interested in. The elves are the best. No, actually, it was everyone across the world. No, it was just the high elves. Here's our spells. This is a page for just high elves. This is a page for just orcs. These pages are sort of generic and weird and for everyone. The lack of clarity of vision runs through the entirety of the background and seeps into the rules in some places. For example, in the spells. Now, the spells themselves work, I presume, completely fine for the game. I barely even come to playing the game properly yet. I am sure that once I play the game, I will have some deep concerns regarding one rule or another. That's always, <laughs> that's always the case of Warhammer. I've played every edition of the game, and each edition has got strengths and weaknesses. Some of the editions are absolutely marvellous, others are less so. But this one here, um, it feels like somebody started off with trying to make Warhammer Revisited, focusing on the old world. And it turned into just the old world. And then it turned into a bit of the old world and a few factions and at one point or another an editor needed to come in and say there needs to be clarity here let's scrub everything clean and just build what we need for this and spent a couple of weeks just hard editing it so that it's shone and that is where i ultimately land i love its ambition i disappointed where that ambition has been cut out and curtailed and leaves us with a product that doesn't feel like the overall ambition has landed. But I also love the focused attention that it's bringing to the old world. But the book that they have doesn't have that clarity of focus, meaning that it does neither job well, leaving me with a not bitter taste in my mouth, but most certainly a disappointment that I can't shift. I actually adore that this exists and adore everything that they attempted, while simultaneously I've got a critical eye that looks at it and says it could have been so much more. So I'm going to conclude with one line that goes all the way back to when I finished off Warhammer 4th Edition. When I finished 4th Edition, an edition that didn't come out the way that I hoped it would, I remember speaking to Andy Leesk, who has been on a previous e episode of Lord mm -hmm. Beards when he was discussing things. Go check that one out. It's over in Sotex channels right now. And I sat down with Andy and I said, look, I've got the core text here. This is interesting. I think this will make a great 5th edition. <laughs> I think this will make an extraordinary second edition. I, could... I think they haven't nailed it yet, but once they get down and realize what they want to make, it will be amazing. It's a little bit like Age of Sigmar first edition. I was about to say the exact same thing. Where Age of Sigmar, they had no fucking idea what they were doing in first edition, and it was garbage, and second edition was fucking amazing. And it's only yeah. gotten better since. And I think that's what we have here. We've got ourselves a game that doesn't really know what it wants to be. And because of that, there's many editorial decisions, there's many writing decisions, and many lore decisions that when you look at it and face value, just leave you a little bit puzzled. For someone who's coming to it for the first time and knows nothing, they'll miss almost all of it. They won't be aware of this, and that's fine. But for those of us who've been playing right from the beginning, we can't help but look at this and say, okay, interesting choices. Okay, I see what you do. Where's all the rest of this stuff that you've been telling me is about to come? It's not here. Well, what's this book doing? And yeah. also, seriously, why is all the background material before the rules? That's going to make it really hard to use as a <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I love it. 
well, simultaneously, I am hypercritical about everything it offers, and I'm super excited to see what's going to be coming next. I am going to be collecting this shit. We'll see how well I do on the actual painting side, but we have a lot to go when it comes to old world stuff because there's going to be more releases to come down the line. And clearly, if our anecdotal well, we're still, evidence is correct, we're still correct, not done yet, but we, we have a lot, uh, a lot of successful release coming too, and that appears to be doing mm -hmm. very well. Um, on my conclusion as well, I'll say that clearly we've not yet finished with the old world. And I don't just mean there's more stuff to come, so we need to do it. We have more books to look at. We have more details from the maps that are online and similar to look at. But whether we'll do that next week or whether we'll take a break to something else um, is going to be a mixture between us two having a discussion. Because yeah, those three weeks have been... I mean, it's almost 10 hours on just one yeah, subject. We will almost assuredly take a break from the old world for next week. I, I don't so. know exactly what we're going to be doing yet because it depends on what CA is up to, but we're going to be doing something. As for, I know we have a lot of questions that people submitted about the old world. I'm going to go type answers to all of those in my Discord because we just <laughs> don't have time. That makes my um, life super easy. Uh, I love so, you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm going to go in there and answer all the questions that I can. And if I see any that I'm like, oh, I really want Andy's opinion on this, I'll shift those over to him because we're that just not going to have time to go over them. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got a Lower Beards um, uh, channel over in my section as well. So if you post them over there, if there's anything else, I'll I'll do answers to any of those over on that side. And Zara, um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really nice way to conclude it all. Um, that was um, a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed yourself as much as we enjoyed ourselves doing this. For all it may have come across as negative at points, I would like to make it very clear that this all comes from a place of love. If you um, want to see us actually salty, go watch the end time stream. <laughs> holy crap! There was yeah, a we got pretty salty difference there. of tone. <laughs> yeah, um, the end time stuff was just legitimately bad in many places. This isn't legitimately bad. It's just some curious choices and arguably impositions on the text from outside. We don't know how this text came the way that it did, but it's what we have, and that's all we can judge it upon. The overall thing is kind of awesome. Yeah. All right. But we will see you all again very soon. And we we're going to get the hell out of here. Go get some food. That's what I need. Lovely yeah. talking to you all. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.